to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. 4.0 workshop. 4.1. It's light on. It's okay. Yeah, it is. It is. Okay. Um, superintendent search with 4.11 Main School Management Association um, providing a presentation to us. Welcome, Steve Bailey and Eileen King. Um, I apologize in advance if I go into a coughing thing. I'll try to keep it to a minimum. Is this a good spot for us? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> We have more pens. More pens. <laughs> I love your pens. <laughs> more writing utensils for Thank you. you. Thank you. First of all, um, you know both of us from prior meetings, so it's good to be here again. Um, if we could start by having you just open your packets that we just gave you, and I just want to reference this brochure because it does indicate that one of the services that uh, Main School Management does provide is superintendent searches, and we'll, we'll reference later on in the evening um, different places where we have done this uh, very successfully. Um, as well as want to provide uh, that level of, of service to you tonight. So this is uh, just a, a quick little handout that you can make reference to uh, for later on, but uh, just to identify um, in terms of our team that's on the very back of this, um, myself, Eileen King, Cheryl Bates, who lives right here in, in Scarborough, is director of our policy and research services, uh, Vicki Wallach, who is our director of communications and government um, relations, and Angie Odette is our key administrative assistant who does a lot of the, the work that uh, you're going to see tonight. She's helped prepare for us in terms of the presentation this evening. So one of the very first things before we get into more parts of the, the presentation, there's a letter on your right-hand side that uh, introduces us as well as our uh, desire and pleasure to be here with you. Um, the next page behind it is an important thing to remember right from the get-go in terms of um, uh, superintendent search. Um, there are statutes that uh, require are required for you to be following uh, with regard to um, promoting equity of opportunity for women in administrative positions. Uh, 1980, there was a, a law, Chapter uh, 889, um, which also requires, requires job description review criteria, non-discriminatory hiring practice, as well as uh, affirmative action plan amendments uh, to make sure that um, this is an open process and making sure that uh, uh, you're, you're looking at diversity as you uh, in, in go through the process. Then second one, Title 20A, 6101.2B, uh, Personnel Records Law, uh, requires all information to be kept confidential relating to applicants for employment, including identities. So this is a really important one right from the get-go all the way through the process, and I would say even beyond the process because things that are learned within the application process uh, needs to remain, need to remain confidential even after because things you learn about the uh, applicants, um, just because you have access to that information doesn't mean the applicant's given you uh, permission to be able to share that information outside of the application process. And the applicants really expect that confidentiality because a lot of them are kind of dipping their toes in and want to find out what your district's about and, and what your expectations are, but they also might be leaving a current employer, so they don't want that employer to know they're not happy, but they're just, they need that, that freedom to search with that, 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 pri that promise to privacy. And you really want the opportunity to be able to explore all, all the different kinds of candidates who might come here to explore, you know, because a lot of it's match in terms of your matching to try to find a superintendent who's going to be right for you. 
but also for them to say, okay, is this community right for me in terms of what the goals and expectations are for that community? So it's really a marriage. Um, and could you do kind of a dating game you know, type of a situation in terms of really looking at, um, is this going to work you know, for, for you from your perspective as well as for the candidates? So that privacy thing is, is really, really important. And then also the freedom of access law, which requires school boards to meet in the public when considering process, like tonight. This is an open you know, public meeting had people wanted to come, which there are some here. Um, and then also um, you need to meet in executive sessions when deliberating on confidential matters, as in uh, reviewing applicants or, or interviews or um, individual conversations about candidates um, that uh, you might be considering. So those are three very important statutes uh, to pay attention to as we go through the process. One of the things that we would do in terms of helping guide you through the process would be to uh, be sure that uh, you're monitoring and, and uh, keeping uh, in line with what needs to happen with regard to those statutes. No, um, I, there's, a, uh, there's a ton of decisions <coughs> that you're going to have to make about how you want to proceed. Um, part going back to the, the, the confidentiality is who's actually going to screen the applications, who's going to see the applications, who's going to do the reference checks, uh, how are those reference checks going to be sure that they're equitable and you're asking people the same questions. And we will probably get in touch more on this later on. But um, the, the searches I've done, um, every one of them is different uh, based on the community, based on how they want to approach uh, developing criteria, uh, how they want, who they want to involve in the process how widespread they want that involvement, who's going to see the information, um, and how can you protect that information if it becomes widespread, how can you protect that kind of confidentiality. So it's, it's, it's a little bit of a, you know, walking in, on eggshells sometimes until you get that all figured out. But all the, the districts that we've worked with have kind of come up with the process, has been very smooth, it's worked very well, and uh, right now, in January, they're all happy. Yes. <laughs> And speaking of January, uh, because you're starting a process now, you're in a good position to be able to make sure you've given yourself enough time to be able to both uh, adv advocate, recruit, advertise, uh, to be able to uh, make sure you get uh, the people looking for the position. And it's going to be early in the process uh, for a lot of folks, uh, and so uh, that may be helpful for you in, in making sure you get a good candidate pool. Um, so one of the things that we'd like to help you do in terms of walk through the process and, 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 and seriously, as, as we go through, well, we have many materials to go through, and I know we have a little under an hour to make sure that we do this. I want to make sure you stop us at any time you have a question uh, that either may be pertinent to what we're talking about or something that we haven't covered. Um, so uh, don't hesitate at all to, to uh, raise questions. Uh, two Stapled packets on the right-hand side are things that we'd like you to take a look at next, if you would. Um, I'm going to turn to page 9 to begin with, only because I think it's important for um, 9 of the, the large packet. Um, it's important to understand that, that this is a, a pretty time-intensive process, uh, and it does take some time to go through all the steps uh, properly. And when I say properly, to give yourself enough time to do them so you really feel like you have uh, the input, the information you want to be able to make the decisions you need. So we set up an approximate three-month timeline. So that's about 12 weeks. Uh, we would say 12 to 14 weeks is, is a pretty typical process to be able to uh, get the kind of information you want. And sometimes that might even be longer if that first, um, first month is, is needed or used to be able to identify the kind of candidate that you want based on community input or uh, input from whoever the stakeholders are going to be to identify the criteria that you might want to do that. So we'll, we'll talk about the different steps, but I just wanted you to kind of get in your mind that we really are talking about a three about a three month process to be able to have uh, this walk through. Hillary, do you have a question? Steve, yeah, I was just wondering, um, is this pro this process starts after we come up with the type of after we come up with the procedure we want to use in terms of like the committees that we want to use and what types of you can actually community you can involved start the advertising. Right process at the same time at the same time okay. so that can run parallel to each other and actually help because you got it earlier so I'm sorry. right and and the districts that I work with one of the most successful districts as far as meeting timelines is as they were advertising they also determined early on how many committees there were going to be okay. who was going to be involved 
um, how they're going to get the information from the community, whether it was going to be through a survey, whether it was going to be for a public forum. And then what they did very early on is they identified dates that everything was going to happen. And so it was April 1st last year, probably by April 8th, we had a list of dates when everything was going to happen right up to May 22nd. So we, everyone knew. So if you wanted to be on that committee, the date was already established. And it really made for a very smooth process because that was done initially right on and right right ahead, right at the very beginning. But that type of work can be done parallel yes. to mm -hmm. advertising. Because yeah. you're going to put your ad out, and you're going to probably sit up, sit, let it sit out there for at least three weeks, maybe okay. a month. Yeah. Um, it was going to be um, nationally advertised. It will be advertised, obviously, in the state of Maine. It will go to all the state associations. Um, for all the AASA was the superintendent association uh, school spring if you decide to go on that on that uh, national site so you're going to want to give people enough time because at the same time remember candidates are going to be interviewing you mm -hmm. uh, so they're going to be digging into your website to see what's on you know your website and see what your district is all about and, and they're going to be wondering if this is a good match for them so so that that time frame is, is going to be needed so while you're advertising that's a really good time to do that organizational work to plan on how we're going to get this information and, and really putting the cart before the horse so that it's a very streamlined, sequential process. Okay. Yes, Nick. Yeah. Uh, you had mentioned uh, national process. Is it possible to, to focus that on a regional area for, if we were to focus in New England as opposed to going national off the bat, or is that, is that something you've done in the past? It is uh, very possible. Matter of fact, we could put uh, more emphasis on uh, the regional uh, New England uh, you know, emphasis um, in terms of our state organizations because we do have access to both the um, the state organizations as well as the national NSBA. But we, we also send it to each of the um, individual uh, uh, superintendent associations as well as the um, uh, school board associations within each of those, those uh, six states. Excellent. Thank yeah. you. The other part, uh, and we'll talk more about uh, advertising specifically, but uh, we, we do typically use, um, uh, if, if the district wants, um, uh, School Spring is, is one that is used. Uh, I think if, if you have a, a membership already to uh, serving schools, that's another one that uh, I know New Hampshire and Maine I use you know, quite a bit, and anybody coming to the state of Maine will be looking you know, on that particular um, employment uh, service to be able to We have a access. subscription to serving schools, and we have used School Spring too. Okay. Excellent. Good. So now if I could, if I could take you back in this uh, large packet, um, we talked a little bit about the consultant team, um, but if you take a look on, on page seven and just review a little bit with us uh, the overview of the MSMA uh, superintendent search services. Um, you're the people who have the most important job of, of hiring the superintendent, and that's really one of the most important roles of, of you as a school committee, school board. Um, but at the same time, it's nice while you're in the process of doing that, if you have somebody on the side to help you, guide you on the steps to make sure that uh, you're doing it both legally as well as, um, you know, don't um, misstep in terms of uh, either confidentiality or privacy of, of, of some particular issue. Um, and so it's nice to be able to have someone as a consultant to assist the school committee in the selection process. So that's what we would do. Um, you also need to decide whether or not the full school committee or a subcommittee will be responsible for the process. I mean, you've got a, a, a committee of seven. Um, you could have, and we have seen, uh, some cases where a subcommittee has um, helped guide the process, you know, for the full committee if, if the availability of everybody's not there to be able to meet when you need to meet. But that's something you'll need to decide. Is this something that all seven of you, um, in terms of full voting members, you know, would be involved in that? Can I um, ask a question about that, Steve? Sure. Um, from your perspective and experience, what are the pros and cons of going with a smaller committee of the board versus the whole board? And typically it was where they had larger boards. Like one of them had a, 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 a subcommittee of about five. That I, I, it was Mount Blue mm -hmm. that I was doing last year. That, and they had like a 16-member uh, mm -hmm. board with seven members, you know, where you have here. Uh, it may be more likely that you might do that, you know, with everybody involved in that, in that process. So have you seen some success with a board of seven yes. or less um, being all on the committee yes. and doing this? In one of the searches I did last year, there was a what they called the interview committee, um, and it was made up of the board and the board chair, and then it was made up of different members of the community 
uh, different staff, administrators, parents, and they did the initial interviews. And then from <coughs> that interview committee, names were sent to the, the full board for a second interview. So the full board was involved in the second interview, but the board chair and the vice chair or two board members were involved. Um, whatever you folks would decide were involved. And that way you had people, um, you know, teachers and administrators involved in, in that process as well. Um, that gets into a lot of things like, you know, when you develop your, and I'm going to get into this in a minute, your leadership profile, what are the skills, what are the attributes that you want your new superintendent to have? How are you going to gather that information? Is it going to be through public forum? Is it going to be through survey? We've done both. Um, we can come down and, and conduct a public forum to gather that information. We can also do a survey monkey that can go out to the community. Then based on that information, then you've got your, your leadership development criteria. We can develop a scoring rubric that will match that criteria so that when you're scoring the applications, you're really looking at this is what we want and here's the application and how does that align and how, do, and how does this person meet the criteria that we want. And so who does that work? Um, does it, you know, so that's the, those are the conversations that you need to have. Um, I've seen full boards involved uh, at the very end. It's been very successful. And um, so it's been done a lot of different ways. Thank you. The next bullet in this, the top part of the sheet is whether or not others or whether others, administrators, teachers, citizens will be involved. And so, you know, that's another you know, conversation for you as a board to have. What level of involvement do you want to have? And typically, they're on the interview committee. They're not in terms of in, engaged in conversations you would be having in terms of decision making, you know, as a board. That would be an executive session that you'd have uh, those level of conversations with, with the, the seven of you. Um, and then the last part, um, whether or not the uh, school committee will be responsible for the candidate's expenses. You may want to have uh, visits be done by candidates coming here. You may want to um, make visits uh, to uh, candidates someplace else. And so dealing with how expenses would be dealt with if, you, if you're going to support that. And I think it's important early on, and this is something I learned last year, is that at the very end of a search, one of the committees wanted to have an open interview, possibly an open interview with the two candidates, or have the candidate one spend the morning, one spend the afternoon. And I said, have you told the candidates that ahead of time? And they said, no, we hadn't. And so that gets back to that confidentiality. Did someone get to that point? Are they ready to tell their employer? So I think ahead of time you need to make those decisions so the candidates entering know that the process is going to be closed and confidential until this point. However, when we get to this point, if you were one of the finalists, it, will, it could become a public a public process and your name could get into a paper and I think it's just nice for the candidates to know ahead of time. And that would be one thing that we would be there as we would be having meetings with you uh, to be able to help uh, remind, okay, at, at this particular point we're going public so we need to make sure that the candidates are aware of that and have that information. The other, the other thing that during the whole process is that Steve and or I are available for you for every single step of the process so when you get through screening applications, what's next, all right? We need to develop questions. Okay, how are we going to do that? All right, these are some ways we can do that. When you get through developing the questions, what's next? So we're there for every single step. So we're not going to kind of give you some information and then say good luck. <laughs> we are definitely going to be, you know, on the phone with you or, 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 or with you every step of the way, you know, helping you to get to the next step and making sure that it's a smooth transition. So as I, Eileen mentioned, I mean, there are about five different steps, five phases in, the, in this process. And uh, the, these phases happen during that uh, 12 to 14 uh, week period. Um, and some of them can be done uh, at, at the same time. Um, uh, but there are some definitely uh, steps that are important in the process to make sure that you're not leaving one out as you go to make that important decision. So, um, so the leader development profile basically is what I kind of talked about, is that what kind of a person are you seeking? What, what, are the, what are the skills and attributes that you want in your next superintendent? Um, and what, what do they need? Uh, what are the skills they need to be successful in this district? What are your major issues? What are your expectations for the district? What are your expectations for the superintendent? And from that, we develop a leadership profile. It's also how we also help to develop and make sure that we have um, your job description is, is really right to the point as far as what you're looking for so that the people that are applying know exactly what they're applying for. Uh, I did talk about um, with the criteria um, that, that you do develop. We can help you develop a scoring rubric that will align with the applications. So when you start to look at the applications, one of the things we find helpful is that people all have a consistent list of questions or a consistent list of, of, of criteria to score that application. So you're not just kind of scoring it from your own 
um, personal experience or from your, you know, your own background, but you're, you're kind of aligning it. So we try to make it as equitable for the candidates as well, but it's also for you folks that you're kind of scoring it from the same lens. You're trying to look at this candidate from what are the district criteria and what is the rubric and how can we kind of try to look at that from the same lens. You're not kind of coming at this from a lot of different places. Um, Eileen, do you have them do like double, uh, dual, dual scoring or triple scoring? So like one, three people score the same person? Like Every, everyone's school, well, I've never had them work in groups, but that's certain. No, not in groups, but um, I score it and then it goes to you and you score that same one so that there's more than one set of eyes on an application. Everyone scores. Everyone scores. The processes okay. I have done is that everyone would score. So let's say Eileen okay. King applies. You're going to have my application. You're going to have the, the scoring rubric. And the people that are on the screening committee, okay. it might not be all of you. It might be some of you. It might be the interview committee. It depends on who you decide to be on the committee. They each score, okay. and then we tally the That's scores. Um, and we can do that for you. And then we can uh, say these are the list of the candidates, and this is the order they came in on. Uh, and, and so that's we have everyone to participate depending on how you decide to screen the applications so um, the other thing is the candidate recruitment so from also as, as we're developing your leadership profile uh, we do do a graphic advertisement and what I'm going to do instead of talking you through this on the left hand of your packet if you kind of go to there uh, what we did today is we just kind of threw together some examples um, this was something we put together uh, Angie put together for us um, and it's from the Scarborough School Department. And it's certainly something that you would want to weigh in on. You might want to use different pictures or different graphics, but this is something we just put together for an example of, of what could go out. Um, and it talks about the opportunity. It talks about the position. Uh, it talks about the deadline, the effective start date, and how to apply. And this is a very kind of a vague one because we just did it from your website. It, from your website, <laughs> as an example. Um, the next one behind that is an example of one we did for Cape Elizabeth, um, and this is uh, what their application, what their uh, look, what it looked like, and uh, it does a um, nice summary of um, where it's located, uh, the salary, commensurate with experience, they're looking for a dynamic leader who shares a vision of exceptional innovative education, is able to continue moving our district towards its goals, what the application deadline, what the effective date is, how to apply. Um, and so that's one that we wanted to sh show you. So you guys have some idea on what some of the examplers look like. MSAD 15 was Gray New Gloucester. Um, this is one that, uh, this is what they put together when they put their, their uh, information out. Uh, and uh, this is what they, their board agreed on. And we certainly can give you different examples. The next one is uh, Mount Blue, uh, which is kind of pretty. Got a nice picture of, of the Mount Blue District, um, and uh, it's, we could do with the we do the marshes in Scarborough. Those are you know nice, <laughs> and, uh, um, but uh, and it talks about the size of the district and uh, how many schools it has. Uh, it does uh, it does spell out some of their their assets. They have strong visual and performing arts program, comprehensive special uh, programs, uh, special needs service and services program, um, and then. Um, it talks about the position, once again, and how to apply. Uh, the next one is one from Rangeley that we did. Uh, once again, as you can see, they all contain a lot of the same information, uh, but you certainly want to have your information pop out. So if there's something you want to make sure that you feel is different about, different about your district, uh, either a performing arts center or a special uh, outdoor education learning program or whatever it is, you certainly want to make sure that you highlight something you think is really special about the Scarborough schools. And then um, there's one last one, which is RSU 38, which they actually put together um, and we have on file. It's a little bit more comprehensive. This could certainly go out. Um, it kind of gives you a little bit more in-depth information about your schools. We could certainly work with you on this. Uh, and it talks about, um, it also does give you some budget information on the back, the total stock, the total students, and it gives you a, a picture of the state of Maine and where it's located. Uh, so this is a little bit more in-depth, but this would certainly become part of your application packet 
that it goes into a little bit more information than just snippets of, of, of so this larger one as well as the two smaller ones, these are more like examples of brochures that we could either put together or if you have information that you want to put together in, in that type of format, we could use in terms of the advertising and rec rec recruitment process. And so as Steve said, the last two that I didn't get to were the brochures. Uh, this was for MSAD 75, the Board of Directors. And as you can see, um, they've got a little bit about their mission statement, the application process, the selection criteria. Uh, who the board of directors are, uh, the administration staff, and the schools uh, are listed there. And then also uh, Camden uh, Five Town CSD also has a summary of their district, their schools, their expectations. So if you want to include your leadership development profile, who you're looking for, uh, the successful candidate will, and have some of those adjectives listed there. That's certainly something you could do. So there are a lot, there are a lot of ways that we can get information out to the candidates that, that are interested in applying. We find that many of the candidates, uh, they'll go right directly to your website. They'll be able to you know, look, look for a lot of information, but if there are certain things that you want to highlight it, you know, through a brochure or through an ad, to make sure that you know, the, the candidates will see that, that's a way, too, of making sure that those can be highlighted. So what, what happen is once you decide to... Are these all districts that you've worked with in the recent past? Yes, yes. and in the very back of the, one of these, uh, one of the handouts, there's also some people that you can call for references. Okay. Yep. And just out of curiosity, did you just do the most recent search with Cape? We did. We did. Okay. Um, so um, once, the, once the information goes out, once the, average, average, the ad is posted, then uh, what we will do is we will make sure that um, when someone contacts us, we will send them out the information that they need to have. Um, and I need to go back to Hillary's Okay, point. go ahead. The most recent one. I was going to say. The I was most thinking. recent one, no, Hillary. Um, but there were three others that were done uh, where MSMA was involved. But okay. the most recent one, no. Okay. But they had so, two recent hires, didn't they? Like, they had... They had an interim for two years, yeah. and they had uh, two searches the two prior years, okay. right? So they've had, like, three, three major searches in five years. Okay. So once the applications come in, what our office staff will do is they'll make sure that the application packets are complete. We don't screen applicants. Um, we don't weigh in. This is your decision. It's your board decision to make those decisions. However, one of the things Steve and I have agreed to do is that if something comes across our table, our desk that we feel the board chair needs to know, uh, we'll certainly share that information and, and let them know that this came across our, our so desk. So that goes on to the top of page 8 in terms of the large uh, packet again, in terms of candidate screening. Um, once they come, if, if uh, you agree that they would come to our office, and basically that's very helpful because uh, Angie would, would look at the applicants, make sure that all of the things that were asked for you know, were, were as, as part of the packet. And then Eileen and I would go through um, the, the packet, the full packet, to make sure everything was complete, as well as it met the criteria that you had set up. Um, at that particular point in time, uh, we would work with you in terms of identifying and, and setting up a uh, uh, inter interview schedule. Um, you would have to uh, make sure that uh, you would be looking at uh, the uh, applicants that you wanted to actually have interviewed. So once we have the, the application package, the screening committee, we would make sure they would uh, be available <laughs> to you. Uh, how we do that, and it can be done a variety of different ways, but we can physically have the applications with you and just bring them here. The other thing that we've done that uh, districts have found to be successful is we um, copy them as PDFs into a, a, a very s secure um, format and on a secure website where you would have a double password uh, to be able to enter those. So you could screen whoever this was on the screening committee would have access to that full set of applications so that you could do that in real time, not have to come to a central location to be able to uh, look at those uh, packets and be able to identify, use the scoring rubric that Eileen talked about earlier to be able to identify, go through and then look and, and rate your, your candidates. There's, so that can be, that can be done, uh, has been done very successfully and people have liked the flexibility of being able to have access to that uh, and then being able to come together after you have that information. We would be also helpful in um, uh, communication with the candidates. Um, many districts have liked that because they don't have um, 
access to central office staff would be able to do that, or they don't have, I mean, you, don't, you are not going to have a board secretary necessarily to be able to do that. Um, so they have liked uh, the fact that we would be able to make that communication and be able to provide the, the level of information to the um, people who would be interviewed and set those interviews up, as well as to communicate th um, through phone call or letter to the unsuccessful candidates, being those folks that uh, didn't uh, succeed in, in accessing an interview with you. Um, we also would provide uh, orientation to you uh, as a school committee uh, and assist with the selection of finalists. Now that orientation of school committee, um, there's uh, a list of different things that we'll go through in a different packet, but there are a couple of different workshops that we would highly recommend uh, doing with you. One of them is a, a, a separate, specific confidentiality workshop in terms of how to deal with all of the application materials that you get, as well as dealing with the references, reference checks, as well as um, um, where and how and what you can say and what you can't say in terms of uh, your, your, your committee. Uh, once you're out, outside the executive session or the uh, aspect of the applications. The other workshop is uh, just the one of going through in terms of the, the interview process itself, uh, the, the questions that would be asked, uh, developing your process for what you would be using for actually going through the interviews. Um, the, another important one, and this would be for uh, Leanne or whoever else is going to be doing this, but uh, making sure that you have a reference check process in place uh, that's consistent, uh, that's legal, and that is one that could be used uh, to be able to make sure that uh, you get the best information you can on each of the candidates that you want to be coming to your district. And if there's more than one person doing reference checks, the same questions are being asked. Right. So it's important that the uh, full board have an evaluation of the finalist. Uh, we, would, we would help uh, and assist with you uh, in, in terms of making sure what's, what's needed for that uh, full evaluation of the finalist. Um, we would schedule interviews if you've uh, narrowed it down to one or two or three, um, advise you regarding the reference checks and assist uh, you in the preparation for site visits and final interviews if indeed you decide that you want to do those site visits because that again is you know, one of your decisions about uh, that part of the process. Final, final phase in terms of appointment, once you've made a decision and um, you've had um, uh, a yes given to you by the candidate, um, we would inform other finalists, uh, assist you in the contract preparation process and negotiations for the contract if you want that kind of help. Um, and then we'd also provide support in closing the search and, and uh, processing the materials because that's an important part of what do you do with everything you've got after the fact to make sure that's, that's uh, kept and, and stored in a, in a legal manner as well. Any questions? Yeah. Can, I, can I ask a clarification question? Um, Going back to phase three, just really quick, and when I've uh, been involved with executive level searches in the past, a lot of what you're describing sounds similar to what an HR office would do. And so I, I just want to clarify that in phase three, when, when this line says the MSMA consultant would screen candidates against selection criteria, I'm assuming, and I'm going to make up round numbers here, that if 50 applications were to come in, uh, and only 30 of those met the minimum requirements, education, experience, certifications, whatever that that would be the type of screening, the more objective level screening that you would do, and then the 30 that make it through that first gauntlet, if you will, that's what would come to us and our, our I'm just trying to figure out the layers of this. You just make exactly. sure that the application packets are complete as okay. you requested. That's great. So they have the certification, yeah. that they have the experience that you're right. asking for, that they have the, the transcripts, the letters of recommendation, you know, that type of thing, that we make sure complete. those are they complete have packets. Yeah. Perfect. Subjectivity is now part of our role. Good. That was, that was, that was my question. Awesome. So Thank if you. all 50 applicants had a complete package, you're giving all. us 50 applicants. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay. So in terms of, we looked at the proposed timeline as to what it could be, and if we just look down through those steps on a month-to-month -month basis, that advertising or brochure development you really do need to decide up front um, what it is you want to get out there to be able to advertise the position. And in place sh should be the job description because what we'd like to do is be able to send that out as well. I mean, people should know what they're be, you know, required to do or being asked to do as part of that process. Um, launching of the community and staff qualifications and experience survey. That's something that can be done at the same time, but you need to decide how far out or how narrow you want that to be. 
Um, just from experience here, it would seem like you'd want that to be, you know, as broad and as transparent as you can make it. Um, and in terms of that process, you need to decide, okay, what's, what are the logistics of making sure that can happen in a time-efficient manner uh, to make sure you get the kind of information you want. Um, you, oh, go ahead. Just a question on that. It seems like some of the information you would get back from that survey would ultimately go into the job description. Right. That's what I'm not clear on in the sequence. So the information that you would get back from the, the survey um, and these community conversations, would that ultimately need to go back into the job description? Well, that is one thing that, I mean, you have identified that as a job description that you have on file. And, you know, whether or not you take a look at that and say, is, is the job description something that you think you need to revise? Uh, based on what the logistics and, and the legal responsibilities of the, the superintendent would be. Yeah. Sometimes you might find uh, criteria that you get or desires you know, from the community that would play into the job description. But in terms of the, the general logistics of what a superintendent does and is responsible for, um, that's pretty well. This could actually weigh in on the scoring rubric, which you get back from the community. You're going to cluster themes and pockets of, of, you know, interest and needs, mm -hmm. you might in, incorporate those into your interview questions and use them in your scoring rubric so you can pull out more information from those candidates uh, based on what this community is looking for. So it may be more in terms of the selection criteria than it might be in terms of the job description. I would think the job description, right, I would think that what we get from the community is more the type of candidate we want maybe would be a little bit part of the job it description. It seems like it is a little bit overlap, some but over. ultimately it's, it's, it's the it, urgency is getting the job description out. Yeah. It sounds like what you're proposing is that the job description itself kind of underpins the leadership profile, which you would develop in phase one, which would really be more of the kind of, um, I don't want to call it subjective, but I want to call it more of the fleshing out, getting more of that community feedback, whereas the job description itself is, is a, usually a pretty boilerplate yeah. standard yeah. type of thing. So how much we customize that, you know, could actually limit us. Mm -hmm. um, whereas the leadership profile is a little more right. fluid, a little more subjective. And that's why we gave you a couple of different examples okay. of what the ads are looking like, so you can see what they're putting in. Um, they're pretty much the same. Some tweak it a little bit, but um, the leadership profile really will will go down to, to a deeper level. So I just have another question. In your experience, the this month one, month two, month three, when is the ideal time for this to, wh when should month one start? We're starting. Yeah. <laughs> January. We're, okay. we're beginning to see uh, positions open. Yeah. Uh, we've already, this is probably the fifth search that we've been asked to at least initiate and, and begin okay. processing. Um, and we're seeing them across the country because we also receive ads from other states, uh, you know, them being posted as well. So uh, this is a time after December, you know, when people begin thinking about, okay, well, I'd like to explore something different. Um, and so they would be going forward with that. As related to the advertising and brochure development, if you look down into month two, it's important for you to identify, and it goes back to Hillary's question, what's the deadline for applications? When do you want applications? And, to, to come into either our office or if you decide uh, to them to come here. Um, we need to have a date on the ad. Um, and, and typically there, you know, three to four weeks is, is what we try to provide. Um, that kind of keeps the rest of the process uh, kind of uh, lined up with that. Um, but you want to make sure you, you give enough time for people to get the uh, information together that they know they're going to need to be able to have their application complete. Um, you identified, uh, you would identify, um, once you have the candidate pool, um, who is actually going to do, be doing the interviewing. Um, if it's all seven of you, then um, that would be it. Uh, if you had uh, more people, like we said, that would be involved on the interview committee, you'd, you'd be making that decision up front, and uh, those dates would need to be set. Um, and so you, you conduct your semi-finalist interviews, uh, you identify your finalist and kind of repeat that process in terms of until you winter it down to the candidate that uh, you'd want to have come here. The last part, and this, this is important in terms of month three, the reference checks and visits. 
those are things you would need to discuss up front in terms of what do you want that process to look like when it nears the end. Uh, do you want what's the level of detail that you want to try to gain on uh, of the individual and uh, having them get as much information about you so that you know when when you all come back together again and, and the person's hired that you've you've done everything you can to make sure it's the right match and they've had the chance to to examine you know is this a good match for that person as well so. Um, the reference checks are really important. And the reference checks don't have to be on month three. Sometimes they're done a little right. bit earlier. So if you want to do uh, and maybe interview, initial interview, then do reference checks. Some, some districts do the reference checks first, then interview. Uh, then they might do a follow-up reference check with some other, some other candidates that are listed. So that certainly is not etched in stone for that month. You might want to move that up uh, a little bit earlier. But it's also possible after you've had interviews yes. uh, that you could go back to those same people you've talked with that, because some information may come out in an interview that you want to explore. You might a have more some deeply. questions that yeah. you want to follow up on. Um, so you can certainly continue to do those throughout the process. I have a question on that. Um, you had said to make sure that we were asking the same questions of the reference. If we were exploring more information, how would we? Could we I ensure that we're asking the right in the the same questions? In the beginning, what we've done is we've done a reference check checklist that has a variety of questions, and you might say, we want to ask these 10 questions. Okay. But as you move through the process, it does become more personal okay. based on the candidate. But initially, to get some of the same information, uh, we have provided that reference check. You, you certainly don't have to use it, but with a list of reference questions that are going to get you some good information. However, once you have that initial interview, you might have specific questions as it relates to that candidate based on what their answers were, and you might want to have a follow-up on that. Thank you. So turning the page to uh, page 10, um, these are recent searches that have been conducted by us. Um, you see last year, 2017-18, uh, there were eight uh, full searches that we did, and then uh, 17, uh, there were um, seven partial searches. When I say partial, um, the boards in some of these situations were small um, and they wanted to take uh, ownership for some of the steps themselves. So they didn't ask us to do the in entire search. Um, but then you see in 16, 17, and 15, 16, uh, MSMA has participated in, in multiple searches. Um, before we go to the very last page on, on this one, I'd like to have you just uh, go to the smaller packet, which is, uh, I think, three pages long. And... This is a, an actual cost proposal because we don't know what you ultimately will be asking us to do. Um, essentially, we work on a, a do, <laughs> 150, 150 uh, per hour plus the cost of advertising um, basis. And that's for our, our work, uh, whether we're together or whether we're coming separately. It also helps uh, the uh, staff, the work that's being done in our office. Um, there are additional search-related expenses that would be borne by the school committee, telephone postage, consumable supplies, um, fee-based advertising, such as if you were to want to go out with um, School Spring, I think that's uh, $250 for 90 days. And so that would be a cost that uh, would be charged to the school committee you know, to be able to do, but it gets your ad out further. And so it, it would go beyond what the uh, uh, serving schools would be. Uh, travel expenses of the candidates at both the semi-finalists and finalist levels. If you had people coming from afar and they needed to be flown in, uh, that would be something that uh, you'd want to consider whether or not you're going to be uh, having that expense. Um, travel expenses for school committee to visit a candidate's home district. If you decide you're going to be doing a, a site visit someplace else where they're, uh, if it's in Massachusetts, Vermont, or someplace further up in Maine, um, that basically that you'd want to be considering uh, you know, having that expense, it would be a, a school committee expense. That's, that's not an MSMA expense. And then uh, consultant travel expenses, so you know, time that we'd be coming back and forth to be able to help, uh, that would also be included as, as part of the, the service. Um, we can and do an awful lot. From Augusta? from Augusta, yeah. Um, however, the, the the trip home is shorter, Hillary, because I although maybe longer for you. I, I go to West Bath, so it's it's shorter to go to West Bath than it is yeah. back to Augusta. So. <laughs> well, mine's six and one half against the other. Blue Bay Harbor. Could I ask you a question? Sure. Um, is there the ability, I guess, primarily time wise, to start on a more regional? focus um, search and then widen it if necessary? 
You can do that if you, if, I mean, if you get to the point where you don't have any candidates that you're feeling is a match, then you certainly can broaden it. But in this day and age, um, it's hard not to start with a broad search. It, it's not going to change that much once we send things out. Um, so I, I don't think I don't see where that would be helpful. I don't. I don't think so either. I was also thinking about. Um, Districts who had to go out two or three times, it also raises a little bit of a question, uh, how come they're not getting the candidates that they want? Mm -hmm. and, and so that's the other you know, concern that I guess I would express you know, up front. I mean, if you were to broadcast and, and, and uh, keep it open for the length of time that you wanted, um, and, and, and if you needed to afterwards, because then you really didn't uh, get the pool that you wanted, um, then there'd be a legitimate reason you know, why, why you might open it up again. Okay, thank you. Is, is the 150 for each of you? No. Or combined? Combined. Okay. And actually, I have another question I'm about that. I'm 50. He's one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you had said, like, we're available by phone. Anytime, any questions you have, like, how is that all calculated into the per hour cost? And it really depends on, you know, what's, what's the significant level of, of what the question requires. I mean, if it's a phone call for a quick answer, you know, we're not, we're not a lawyer, so we're not going to be... Uh, that was my <laughs> <laughs> We don't have a clock. No, if it doesn't start drinking. I think, I think the work well, that you're going to be looking at is... They keep you on the phone for 15 is, minutes so they can do your 15-minute charge. <laughs> Tell um, you three or four stories. And yeah. Right. You know, the amount of uh, development of scoring rubrics, development of questions, or preparation of questions, sample questions to send out to you folks. Right. Um, that type of work that will require us just sitting down and getting some things done. And we have a lot of resources that, that already, but based on what your question is, but if it's just a, a procedural question. If you call her after 10 o'clock, it's going to come. In the morning? <laughs> uh, you indicated in the last academic year you were involved at least partially in 15 superintendent searches here in the state. I I'm just curious, how many searches, you may not know this number, how many searches were conducted last year statewide, and, and is that on par with what we'd expect this year? Uh, I'm just wondering how many searches there are each year in Maine for superintendents. Um, I think at least there were four others that were conducted that we didn't participate in that we know of. Um, and, and my guess is, to be honest with you, um, it's starting early this year in terms of the requests that we've had so far. Um, so. Uh, and we also know that there are superintendents who are looking to retire or the changes in positions and those kinds of things. So um, The domino effect. Yeah. You know, so yeah. one superintendent fills from another one district, then that opens up something else in another district. I'd say 15, 16 would be pretty yeah. typical. Wow. When, so, oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. sorry. When you use the word recruitment, um, are you talking about advertising and posting yes. on websites, or is that your personal relationships with other we superintendents? We, we really don't involve ourselves personally. One thing I no, but one thing I do know other districts have done, and, and this could be part of this process, where uh, information is mailed, you know, to other districts in Maine. So, you know, we wouldn't mail to districts in Massachusetts. We put it on our on our website, or or do it uh, serving schools or or school spring. But, uh, you know, some districts have said, well, we'd like to put, like, one of those flyers uh, with a letter, you know, and kind of uh, promote that we've got an opening. Uh, that does add to your advertising costs because you've got mailing, mailing costs to do that as well. So, so, for example, if you wanted to mail to every school district in Massachusetts, <coughs> Vermont, Connecticut, and mm -hmm. New Hampshire, um, that would add right. um, versus us sending it to their state association and getting on their web page. So if you mm -hmm. want to get more, and, you know, there's... Mass, the, several Massachusetts districts do do get you know you get a brochure from them. Um, it's sent to the superintendent at every school system in Maine uh, to let them know there's an opening. So um, that does happen. But if that's something you want to do, that would be certainly an increase in your advertising costs. Do you do any kind of creation of like a digital? Say we wanted to have a web page or a landing page for superintendents to gain information. So basically, a digital brochure that we would maybe put a link to on our website. Do you guys do any kind of that development? We could. Um, and this is probably the best example of that in terms of what Miranda did, uh, because basically it became a link. And AOS 93 did the same thing, where they, cre they created one. And we could do this, and this would be you know, a, a cost that would take time to do I was just thinking about, in terms of cost, yeah. keeping the printing and mailing costs right. down, it makes more sense in the digital and, age. And both of these districts very successfully you know, use that, because yes. people are going to go to the website anyway. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. 
turning point. So I was just looking at these. Just because I happen to know about Cape Elizabeth, what are the success rates of finding a superintendent for, like, last year you had one, two, three, three, four, eight districts that you worked with? So or, in terms of those, those eight, yeah. um, they're all filled. All filled <laughs> and still filled. Still filled. <laughs> <laughs> And when you say success rate, you know, did they last more than a year? Did they well, last three I years? Like inter I know that Cape ended up going with an interim superintendent, so I'm assuming that what happened was that they didn't find a candidate. That was two years ago. Okay, so right. So they, yeah, they had an interim room for two years, and then Donna yeah. Wolfram is there this year, and uh, she filled that particular process. So year. if you don't end up finding a candidate, mm -hmm. is it a separate process to then search for... An it, interim? It can, it be? can be. Yeah. Okay. Or it doesn't have to be. Okay. And that process is not guided the same way in terms because you're, you're looking for a more specific uh, focus for a particular period of time. And typically you're having someone come in as an interim while you go through the next search right. level for a, a full time. I mean, ideally, obviously, yes. I'd want to find a superintendent. I'm just... If, the so just wondering what happened. Usually, go to an interim as if they they they've done the the interview. They've they've just not found someone or people have withdrawn or right. something. And now we're looking at it's July, and the right. work list just kind of settle down, have an interim, you know, have for for a year, start the process again early on with a mm -hmm. with a fresh group of, of right. candidates. Um, so the interims usually come when either. Um, Steve left his job uh, July 17th, so they filled that position with an interim. Um, and I left my job um, January 2nd, so they filled my position with an interim because it was just an odd time of year. Right. Or it was late in the hiring process. You guys are really at the very beginning of the search process for superintendents right now. So you're, you've set yourselves up to have a really nice time frame to get this work done. Okay. Is the average turnaround time that superintendents spend in districts still around five years? Less. Less. So three, three to five. Three to five, three to five years. Okay. So the last page in that smaller packet is uh, just a, um, a breakout of some of the costs and if 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 a very if a full decision was made in terms of, of uh, you coming on board with us and you wanted us to do all this work then we will be doing. Uh, portions of, of, of each of these uh, bullets all the way down through. Um, where the, if you didn't do uh, community uh, focus groups, uh, that, that shaves time as well as cost off your particular one. However, I would, I would say to you um, to do the process the way you want it done right is more important than um, thinking about what the nickel and pennies you know, might be in terms of you know, the result that you'd want. And, and be sure that you're involving um, you and whoever you need to have be involved to make sure that that, that process is, is right. Um, but we also, as part of that, you know, would be developing questionnaires. Now, those questionnaires, you know, could be used uh, digitally. They wouldn't necessarily have to be used in, in forums. But in, in some of the searches that I've done, we've used the same questions online as what were used in the uh, personal upfront forums. And you just you know, combine the information. Basically, you're trying to get to the criteria and trying to, to identify candidate profiles. Um, so do you, sorry, do you facilitate the forums? Yes. Okay. We could. I mean, that, right. that's a service that we have provided and, and do do, and that allows you to participate. It allows you to be you know, kind of there as opposed to having to, to operate and, and, and run the process and also uh, keeps... Um, uh, let's say someone from central office to having to do that. I mean, that's another, another possibility. You tend, um, to get, you tend to get pretty much the same quality information, whether you do a form <coughs> or a survey. It seems like maybe a survey might be a little bit more efficient and time friendly. It can be. Um, there are people that prefer to be present and, and come to a mm -hmm. um, and you can form. As, as Steve said, you can do both. Yeah. Um, one of the districts I did, we had over 300 people respond from the community. Right. Um, so then we were able to look at, and then, then you folks get that those results, and you can able to see, you're able to see um, you, 
throw away the really negative comments, throw away, you know, so kind of, you, you always kind of look for the, but uh, the middle, not middle of the road, but you just, you know, sometimes you have to weed through some of the information. So are there things that you look down through on that list and have questions about? Yeah. I have another quick question. So, I mean, if we're trying to generate a general estimate for the cost of the district, the real big variable here is how many applications we receive, because I see that's one of your variable costs, one to one and a half hours per application. So that would be something we want to think about as we're kind of generating an estimate. That's true. However, um, that is something that can be compacted somewhat in terms of because last year we were getting in the neighborhood, and this was for some smaller districts and not in, not in southern Maine, um, we were getting 18 to 21 applicate, applicants here for positions. So, you know, you, you throw out the figure 50. Um, I just made that up. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. But that would be an awful lot. It would be. Yeah. Well, that leads me to um, my question on page 11. I maybe yes. we'll have a little no, bit. No, no, that's fine, because the, it goes back to Nick's question, too. On the big pa yep. um, package, I noticed that three of the um, school references are pretty consistent in price, and then one was a lot more. Mm -hmm. Was that because they had a, a, um, many more applicants? More applicants and, and more specific um, guidance along the way in terms of... Uh, monitoring the process and helping with the process. There was another one that's not on this list, but um, RSU 15, that was uh, closer to, I think, $14,000 in terms of, uh, of being here a lot and, and being uh, uh, an active help with, within the process. What town is that? That was uh, Green and Gloucester. So do you find that it, that it is also commiserate with the size of the district? Not necessarily. Okay. I, I had, you know, if you look at the Wiscasset School Department, it's a smaller district. I did a larger one. Um, it was a little bit less. Right. Um, the Wiscasset School Department really, really leaned on me to really guide that search. Um, mm -hmm. I was there a lot. I worked with them a lot. Um, that was what they wanted, and that's what they would be. Due to lack of, I think, time and expertise, they just felt that. Um, so they made all the decisions, but I was at, I met quite often with them. Mm -hmm. And then uh, a larger district that I did, uh, the board chair was very much involved with me. Uh, and uh, we did a lot of work together along with HR and the secretary uh, so that we would make decisions, but I may not be physically doing the work. Right. So it just depends on, on the comfort level of the board and what their, what their, their needs are. We've had a couple where they, they have had, uh, because they were larger districts, uh, larger HR departments, and so they were able to help out in, in that particular way um, to be able to, to help with that process. And another district that I worked with, uh, they identified, well, we want your help, but we don't want to go above a, uh, a certain dollar amount. And so we, we took a look at, okay, what does that mean in terms of how we want to spend that money? So that would be another way to approach that. So that pretty much is, is the, the presentation. Obviously, if you were to ask us to continue to help you in the process, we would uh, want to come back and identify an outline, you know, specific timetables and, and uh, different conversations that would need to be had as to who the screening committee is going to be, um, dates, uh, application formats, and what does that look like. A lot of that would be done back and forth. Um, in terms of communication, uh, pretty much uh, it would be Angie, who would be um, uh, CCing uh, Eileen and myself, but sending things to Leanne. Um, and if you needed uh, full board approval, you know, for something in terms of how the application would look and what questions you want in terms of to be included with the application, you'd get that okay, and then you would send it back to us, and then we prepare the, the actual documents. Same thing would be <clears throat> same thing would be true for the graphic ads. It would be, I mean, if if, it, if it's not this one, um, if you have tweaks to you know, something like that, then you'd let us know. We'd redo it. We check it with you again before we made it public. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so much. Your punctuality cannot be argued. <laughs> 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 awesome. Thank you. Okay. Do you get a copy of that? Yeah. The, the budget.
Today is Thursday, January 3rd. Welcome to the actual business agenda for Scarborough Public Schools. Um, are there any adjustments to the agenda tonight? There are no adjustments to the agenda because we posted an updated agenda earlier today, but I do just want <clears throat> to bring attention to the changes that were made and why they were made. We, you'll notice that we moved um, both executive sessions toward the end of the meeting, and really that is just typically how we do it um, when we don't have anyone from the outside coming in to be in an executive session and also to be respectful of our community members who are here attending so that way they don't have to sit through us being in executive sessions before we come back to public meeting. So, but that was posted earlier today. I just wanted to make that really clear why we did it. So, thank you. Um, 3.0, public comment on the agenda items. Um, if you could please state your name, your address, keep your message to three minutes or so and direct it at the chair. Fair enough. Um, Jody Shea, 23 <coughs> Windsor Pines Drive. I'm here tonight to ask you to delay um, removing the policy um, with regards to food allergies. I think um, in my email I stated that my feeling is that there needs to be a bigger discussion about this. I think um, the nurses need to be able to take the time to create a protocol rather than getting rid of a policy before a protocol has even been made. Um, I was also told that part of the reason was because there was a law that is stronger than what our policy is, but there's also laws that talk about kids not smoking, and yet we still have a policy on that to talk about what Scarborough, how we would handle it and how that goes. So that's why there's legal references in many of the policies that we have in our book. Um, so the fact that it's law doesn't mean that it needs to be eliminated. These are um, serious issues, life and death, for many of these small kids who don't know um, how to advocate for themselves, frankly. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Charles Spanger from 99 Beechridge Road, Scarborough. And uh, item number six, the student reps, uh, one of them, Ryan O'Leary, is going to speak about the, uh, uh, the idea of solar on the schools. And I wanted to speak to that for a moment. Um, the, this is something that's happening uh, all around. Uh, Portland, is, uh, there's a big effort to get solar on all the schools and get the schools powered by solar. Um, and uh, a number of other towns in Maine are doing the same. So I just want to uh, make sure that everybody is clear on uh, the situation that we face. Um, the uh, in international uh, intergovernmental panel on climate change just issued their report uh, six months ago, and uh, the uh, the results state that. Um, the, we have 12 years to put in place the solutions to our climate uh, issue or too late. Uh, we've been uh, fooling around for 35 years. We've known about the climate science and uh, our society has chosen to do virtually nothing. Uh, there's lots of individuals have taken action in certain towns and this town has taken action. But what it really means, the situation means, is that uh, all uh, everybody who can contribute, including the school board, who can make a, a statement and take action, needs to do as much as they can, as fast as they can, for the interests of uh, our kids. In 12 years, our first graders will be graduating from high school. In 12 years, Ryan and Jackie and, and Dylan will be um, 30 years old, and you know, just getting started on their illustrious careers, and things could start to be could start closing in on people, you know, with uh, all kinds of unexpected uh, issues. Uh, so it's very serious business. And I just want to make sure that everybody is fully aware that uh, you have a responsibility to, to do this. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Sue Braberay. I live at 8 Plantation Drive in Scarborough. And um, I am here because I am concerned that you will be voting to remove JLCEA-R, which um, 
is these students would diagnose allergies and sensitivities regulations. Um, these regulations are very comprehensive and they spell out everybody's duties and responsibilities with regard to children with allergies. And I'll just actually back up one second and then say that I have two children who are at Wentworth and they both have food allergies. Um, the regulations talk about what the nurses will do, what the nutrition staff will do. I mean, we're talking about you know, the cafeteria workers, um, the custodial staff, the bus drivers. I mean, it's very comprehensive. And my concern is if these regulations are removed, that um, we as parents and our children won't be, won't know that these are, are, be, are in place, that people are actually doing them, and then what would our recourse be in the event that they're not being done? So, thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Okay, seeing none. Um, 4.0, recognition. Yes, we have a couple of recognitions <coughs> tonight. I'm just going to refresh this real quick. The first is to recognize our eighth grade ma um, Gates math students who were the champions. They won first place in the stock market game. And this is something that the middle school has been doing for quite some time, right, Joanne? Right. <laughs> I a think lot of former I, students out there should be millionaires by now. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is a really cool um, event competition that our students get to participate in. They get to learn about the global economy and invest, investing. They learn about business. And so we're super proud of our eighth grade Gates um, students for making this, you know, big accomplishment, and I believe that we'll have some more news that's related to this in a future meeting, but we just wanted to take a moment. There was a press release that went out, but um, to, again, just publicly recognize the students who were involved. And I should have a list of all their names, but I don't currently, um, but promise that this will be on an agenda again in the future. The next thing we wanted to take a moment to recognize is the work that our staff and instructional coaches have been doing to step up our communication and showing off their Red Storm pride. And so we have developed these four hashtags um, in, a, in an attempt to sort of take over the Red Storm Pride hashtag initially because there's one other school district somewhere that's using it. Um, but we're really trying to step up our communication game. And if you've checked us out on Twitter or on Facebook recently, you'll notice that we've connected our Twitter page to our Facebook page so that um, anything that gets tweeted is being posted there. We also have put together um, a group of key communicators. There's well over 20 staff and school board members are a part of that as well and we're looking to get some students involved but we want to encourage our whole community to use these four hashtags anytime they're sharing positive news about our school so red storm pride just generally whether it's athletics or academics or um, anything that our, our kids or our student or our staff rather are doing just to kind of shine our shine our light in a positive way Red Storm Learns is being used specifically around um, the more academic focused things, such as um, the work that our instructional coaches are doing, or if you saw anything that was posted about um, the STEM week of code that we had, they were using that hashtag. Red Storm Ready is really about being future ready. And again, we were trying to keep it kind of short so that it doesn't take up too many characters if folks are posting things on, on Twitter where they are limited. And then, we just added a fourth um, since our last meeting, Red Storm Gives, and this was really an idea from our instructional coach at the high school, Michelle Shoup, after um, she was posting something about the Empty Bowl project that our alternatives uh, education program engages in every year, and so really the reality is that our kids are constantly doing all kinds of um, philanthropic work, and we wanted to make sure that we weren't overlooking that or getting it lost in the in the mix here. Um, and so this is our at Scarborough Main Schools uh, Twitter page. This is something that's existed for a long time, but it was kind of dormant. I think it was created a number of years ago, but nobody was really um, using it. 
And so our instructional coaches have really take the lead, taken the lead and then many of our staff have followed. And so you'll see there's little video clips on here. Um, actually the last week before break, at, we were already like amping up our posting, um, but we challenged or I challenged the instructional coaches if each of them could have one quick video, a minute or less posted during that last week before vacation and they, it became kind of competitive. And so I think not only did they have one video, but they posted several. <laughs> they really um, did take, up, take us up on that challenge. And we're kind of hoping that um, this will spread like a really good positive rumor and give us a chance to celebrate our community. So that we want parents to use the hashtag, we want students to use the hashtags, um, and staff so that we're connecting all of these stories together and you know if we really if we do that well then things will start to trend and there's all kinds of other fancy um, social media language that can go along with that that our teachers are teaching us about um, and Sarah <laughs> is helping us with that too um, so we just wanted to highlight or I wanted to take a moment to highlight this make sure that you're following us on Twitter if you're not yet and then um, also explain a little bit about why when you go to Facebook does it not look the same? Um, and so these things are connected through a, 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 an, an alternative or an exterior application called If This Then That. So anything that we post on Twitter goes to our Facebook page. Um, and this is our district Facebook page. I'm not logged in, so it's, um, but what you'll see, oh, it's not gonna let me, let's see. I can show you real quick. Um, what you'll see is it, it looks like this, and you have to then click on the link to get to the video or the picture. Um, we're going to fix that in the future. Um, one of the next step that we'd like to do is add a district Instagram page, because we know a lot of our students live on Instagram. And we're really just trying to create this multi-dimensional, multi-tiered communication platform, um, and we can't do it alone. So I just wanted to recognize the instructional coaches and the staff that have already joined in um, and encourage the community to um, check us out, follow us on Twitter, follow us on Facebook, and of course, visit our website. This is also an attempt for us to sort of streamline some of our communication work so that people aren't having to go to a lot of different places to find out what's going on in our schools. Um, so some of the things we hope to do is, you know, enhance our website so our Twitter feed can be embedded right in um, our main page. So lots of good work going on and really proud of our, our staff for taking that challenge. Awesome. Thank you. Oh, any comment? Okay. All right. 5.0, my favorite part of all of our business meetings, the spotlight recognition. All right, can I, can I do it? <laughs> is um, for Mrs. Dumont. She is a French teacher at the high school and unfortunately she is sick and couldn't be here tonight, which is sad. But we're still going to play her video and um, we'll send her a little email with it embedded in there for her to see. Um, she um, took some personal <coughs> time out of her day to help um, the chorus students. They were doing, well you'll see in the video, but they were doing a um, one of their songs for their concert was in French, um, and she kind of answered the call to help them with their pronunciation and understanding of the song. Um, and so she was nominated for the award. Well, you'll see in the video. Let's just play the video. I think what's cool about this is that it's always a secret to the person yes. nominated who nominated them, and the, the purpose of the video is to reveal that. My name is Patrick Volker. I nominated Miss Dumont for the Spotlight Award. So this is the high school mixed chorus giving a very hearty thank you to Miss Dumont. Uh, we did a French carol for our holiday concerts this year and I emailed all of the French teachers and they all got back to me, but Miss Dumont got, got back to me in like five minutes, gave up 20 minutes of her lunch and helped us out and was really kind and gracious. And it really made the difference between us sort of understanding it and us doing an awesome job on it. So, on behalf of the High School Mixed Chorus, thank, thank you, Mr. Bond. Whenever you're ready. Thank you. 
Uh, hi, my name is Jackie. Um, when Miss Dumont came in, I've been taking French for five, four or five years now, and I still didn't know all of the pronunciation that she taught us. So it enhances just the performance, not only um, when you learn the correct way of saying everything, but it also just makes you feel more confident in your voice and when you're singing. Um, so thank you, Miss Dumont. You were a big help to all of us. My name is Charlotte Pratt. I've been taking Spanish since sixth grade, so I know nothing about French or how to sing in French. So having Miss Dumont come in and teach us how to pronounce all the French words was just so helpful and it was an incredible experience. Thank you. out to the world language program thinking we'll bring in some other teachers and, and make this program a little bit more real for the kids, a little more substantial. And you got back to me in less than five minutes and gave up part of your lunch break to come and help us uh, do something that's a lot different from what your normal job description is. So we really appreciate it. It totally made the difference in um, creating a substantial experience for the kids. I really appreciate it. Thanks. Like I said, Mrs. Dumont can't be here tonight. We have a certificate for her that we'll drop off at the high school um, and we'll make sure that the video gets out. But as usual, we're really proud of um, all the staff members who are nominated and um, it's really nice to be able to highlight some of the stuff that they do for each other. And so you're accepting nominations for next month, right? Yes. Um, so, well, uh, I think I already sent it to, did I send that to you, Kelly? Okay, so um, normally what we do is at the end of a cycle, we send out a letter to all the staff just um, explaining who has won and with a little link to the video and a little link to the nomination form. So hopefully we'll get more and more nominations each month because um, this is really fun for us to be able to highlight some of the amazing things that are going on in the schools. Thank you. Um, 7.0 superintendent's report. Um, 6.0 first. 6.0. Student. Oh, yeah, sorry. 6.0. I did intend to do it. I checked you off. I got so excited about the solar. Yes, the student representative's report. All right. So today we have uh, some members from ECOS who are going to give a little presentation, as you've heard during public comment. Uh, Ryan O'Leary and Jackie Blacho are coming. If you'd like to come up to the podium. You may recognize her from the video. Oh, yeah. I, was, I did check out. Actually, I had the pleasure of meeting Jackie. Yeah. So. Um, hi, I'm Ryan O'Leary, and I'm here with Jackie DeQuattro, and we're presenting about um, the Environmental Club of Scarborough, and we're kind of doing a uh, club update. Um, so a little overview. Um, so our mission is... Uh, as you can see, there's a couple of ECOS members. Um, we seek to be environmental leaders in our community through weekly recycling, lunchroom composting, organic gardening, and other educational projects. Um, we have weekly meetings every Friday after school, and we focus on collecting the recycling around the entire school. We send off like six different routes to collect the recycling, and we also um, last year started a committee project, um, which we'll be talking about today, that focuses on different aspects of like changing, um, making the school more sustainable. Um, we currently have 66 <laughs> members this year and we have about 20 to 25 per meeting. Um, some of our projects that we focused on, as you can see, this is our school garden um, in the courtyard at the high school uh, that was taken last August. And right below it is our planting day, which was last the beginning of last June, um, that some of our eco students helping out with that. 
Um, so we started a school garden, which we, um, we started that two years ago to um, produce food and show like a, a model of sustainable agriculture um, and also be able to donate that to local um, food banks. Um, we've also increased lunchroom composting and education about composting. Um, we've done a silverware project uh, led by Dylan um, to replace all of the um, single-use plastic utensils um, in our uh, lunchrooms to uh, silverware. And I think we have a couple um, schools. We started with Wentworth last year, and we're trying to get more schools on board with that this year. Uh, we've also done letters to the editor about um, different solar legislations passed in Maine. Uh, we've attended uh, state ri statewide rallies and hearings for environmental uh, policies on a state level. And our biggest thing we've done is we've, last year, we sent three students to Washington, D.C. to lobby Congress about um, a nationally proposed carbon fee and dividend legislation. And this past year, we sent five students from Scarborough uh, for that. Um, and then some current focuses that we want to talk about tonight are our hand dryer initiative and also our solar project. Um, so Jackie, if you want to talk about the hand dryer. Um, so just uh, recently in November, um, Eco Maine gave Scarborough High School Environmental Club a uh, $1,600 uh, grant to help us buy four hand dryers to replace paper towels in the school lobby bathroom, so the two bathrooms um, right in the school, in the high school. Um, this has been a project that we've been working on for like the past year, and we finally kind of made big headway on it, so we are really happy to get this grant. Um, as requested by the committee who gave it to us, we needed to present to the school board about the environmental impact, financial impact, and the ability to replicate this project. Um, in terms of the environmental impact, this project is designed to reduce waste because soil paper towels cannot be recycled. So everything that we have been um, using in the bathrooms just goes into landfill in the trash, um, which obviously doesn't help. Um, we figured this would be a great way to reduce the paper towel waste, not only in our school, but hopefully in the community, and kind of make some headway mm -hmm. on small changes that we can do to really help the environment. Um, a few statistics on the slide are 700 gallons of water are polluted every time, every ton of paper towels that we use and throw away, along with 464 gallons of oil being burned and 17 full-grown trees being cut down. These statistics are from a 2007 report about the life cycle assessment of tissue products. Um, in terms of the financial impact of this project, the Outreach and Recycling Committee um, as, long, as well as um, meetings that we have had with Mr. Jepson have both kind of um, given us the information that we needed to know about what it's going to cost to do this project and how we can make this as uh, in financially sustainable as possible. They have agreed to pay for four hand dryers and have fronted the cost for it all, um, and Mr. Jepson has told us that he will pay for the installation of the hand dryers. So we have, it's incredible, um, and this project is something that we're really excited to implement. Um, even though the cost of the installation will be um, not very cheap up front, it will completely <coughs> outweigh the cost of maintaining, having the paper towels um, and the um, installation and maintaining, again, sorry, of the dispensers um, over time. That is a picture on the screen of the one of the hand dryer units that we will be purchasing with the money that we got. Um, in terms of the ability to replicate this project, um, ECOS and the Small Projects Committee on ECOS, which I am the co-chair of, uh, kind of wanted this project to be an ignition um, so that we could hopefully further expand it into the other bathrooms in the school and maybe even the district um, after that. It would be a sort of test run to show the positive impacts of this project and how we can really change the way that we approach paper towel waste um, and our impact on the environment through this. Um, we have seen great benefits from other schools and from reports that we have taken a look at, um, and we're really excited to see this implemented in the next few months. Uh, so the next thing we have is our solar project. 
So uh, last December, December 2017, we had um, a, we started a solar committee with uh, about six to eight students um, with the idea of switching a large portion of the high school's energy reliance to solar power, um, which we understand is a huge goal, um, and that would take multiple years. So um, the timeline, the things that we've already done in the past year is we formed the committee. Uh, we met four times with uh, the facilities director, Mr. Jepson, and an a, a energy consultant with Revision Energy. Um, and that was through January and our latest, that was through January 2018 and our latest meeting was um, October 2018. Um, and we so far have achieved a preliminary solar um, design um, in June of 2018. So just to backtrack why we want this, we want to do this is, um, so obviously climate change has been in the news a lot lately, and there's been um, three major climate reports that have uh, been coming out about, and uh, Chuck has been talking about that um, a little bit before us, um, about where we stand um, on climate change, the IPCC and the um, United States Global, T Global uh, Change Research Program um, just recently, and basically the, just to really sum it up, they have said that uh, in 12 years we will be reaching like a global tipping point on climate change, so it's so important that we do as much as we can now. Um, with Ecos' experience in um, participating in climate action on a national level and a state level, we've realized that there's a lot of delayed action. Um, the United States have pull has pulled out of the Paris Climate Accord, um, and we have a current administration that is rejecting uh, scientific facts about climate change. Um, and on a uh, state level, we've seen that main solar incentives have been phasing out. Um, so what we realize is that it's so important that we do this on a local level and that we um, you know, show that we can do this on a local level and um, inspire other towns to do that as well. Um, so, uh, the current model that we've um, gotten would, s would suggest that we would have um, offset uh, a little less than a million pounds of carbon dioxide uh, annually from the high school, um, and that it would be sustainable long term, um, and it supports the Scarborough Public Schools values. Um, for me, being an, environmental, an AP environmental science student, um, it's very important like for me this issue because I've learned about the climate reports in our class and about um, a lot of environmental um, things that are going on in our country right now. So being able to take that and apply it to um, uh, real action is something that is really valuable to me and I know is valuable to everyone else. So the cost and current status of the project. So the costs, we have the preliminary design which I'd be willing to share with anyone um, and the idea is that uh, we use this thing called the power purchase agreement, which is where a third party, uh, such as Revision, Revision Energy, would make the initial payment and Scarborough Public Schools would pay quarterly until um, we'd be eligible to pay back the system between six and 25 years. Um, and a great example of this is the Scarborough Public Library, which was installed last year. Um, and they use this system to pay for that. Um, so the current status is that um, We've got the specifics on the preliminary design, and we've met with Mr. Jepson. He's expressed that the price is over the current payment um, that we pay for energy usage for the high school, but um, he is communicating with Revision to see if a larger installation would drive unit price down. Um, we found that he's very progressive on this, and that if he was telling us at the last meeting that if it takes um, replacing older um, roof portions of the school, to um, install more solar to, to drive the price down, and that would be something that he'd be interested in looking into. Um, and yeah, um, and one of the things that, because Ecos is so um, involved in this project and we're so passionate, uh, our committee has expressed that we would be capable of fundraising $10,000 um, over the next uh, like two to three years um, for this project. Um, to offset any additional costs. So to conclude, um, we know that Mr. Jepson is very progressive on the installation, but we would want to know what the um, school board thinks about this. And we also just wanted to say thank you so much for letting us speak.
template that you showed with the solar panels on the high school. Mm -hmm. Do you know roughly, like, would that cover the entire energy costs that we're currently seeing in the high school, That's or just a portion of it? Um, I'm actually not sure. We've been just emailing with Mr. Jepson about um, looking into another uh, design if we, like, if he replaced a larger portion of the roof. Okay. Uh, so maybe looking more into specifics, if we could uh, maybe come back and do more of an update on uh, the logistics of this project. I think that'd be helpful because we still are a little bit um, yeah. foggy about that. Totally understand. And then this may be something you want to come back to, and I can do more research on this as well. But just curious what you know about the how effective solar power is in Maine, because I know Maine obviously doesn't get as much sunlight as, say, other parts of the country do. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you have any knowledge on that. I don't have any knowledge on that. Yeah. I think we'd have to revisit that. Cool. Awesome. I know we don't have any like objecting trees or other structures that would get in the way, but... Um, that is definitely something for us to consider. Thank you. I'd, I'd love to see the design that you offered. If you mm -hmm. wanted to send it to us, that would be awesome. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. I, I have a question. Um, do you know how the solar energy and the, the cost of that compares to what Wentworth, doesn't Wentworth have like geothermal mm -hmm. energy? Do you know yes. what the, dif the cost um, I'm actually not sure about the cost, but okay. that's a really good question. I think we should definitely look into that as and well. And do you know what the cost difference is between um, what we currently pay and what we would pay monthly for, um, like you said, Mr. Jepson had told you that there was a cost increase. Do you know what the increase is? I'm actually not sure. I think definitely looking back at the logistics, if we had that second um, design, maybe if we could just look more into exactly what the increase in cost would be. I think this is awesome. I mean, it's really, it's really mm -hmm. awesome, and I think that obviously, it's something that we as a local community need to be thinking about. And the work that you guys have put in on this is pretty amazing. Um, so I'd love to have the information that you have if you want to email that to us, and um, I can talk to Mr. Jepson too and find out some more answers. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Be interested to see if there are any new incentives for solar power as the new. Oh, and also I still hear about the um, silverware at Wentworth. So. <laughs> oh, just yeah. an update on that today. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, um, and then I just wanted to quickly share a photo from Ecos's last meeting. They had a holiday party, and all of the members kind of had different treats and listened to some holiday music, and it was just a fun time. <laughs> That's a big club. Mm -hmm. a big That's club. awesome. Yeah. You all should be commended, not just for the, the importance of this topic, but even the, the philanthropic part that you've brought <laughs> in, the idea of actually raising some money and contributing uh, as students. It, it, you should be commended for that. It's, it's great work. Absolutely. All right, so switching over, um, I want to focus my part of the report on some of the after-school programs that Wentworth has to offer. Wentworth has an amazing string of activities in which students are able to get involved within their school and community. <coughs> um, and one club that I've been personally involved with is the Wentworth Reading Team, and they meet um, for one hour every Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, and they have high schoolers come down to Wentworth on each of these days to volunteer and read with the students, which allows the younger students to make a bond and have special connections with the older high schoolers who can often act as role models. Um, and from personal experience, this activity has been a great way for high schoolers to volunteer and gain leadership skills that they wouldn't have otherwise um, obtained. And Reading Team is always looking for new high schoolers. If um, you have anyone in mind who would like to volunteer, you can contact Mrs. Gorey, Mrs. Krobo, or Mrs. Priscillitz. Um, Wentworth has also started its first news program. Um, once a week, the after-school students, they meet to work together on recording new segments for the news. Um, and I spoke to some students yesterday, and they said how much they loved being able to use the green screen and interview different people from around the school. Um, recently, they were able to interview some gym teachers and the school nurses. This club gives students a chance to meet and interact with kids from other grades 
and learn about the process of creating a news program, which I know that they could use in middle school because middle school has um, a news that they run, I think, once a week. Um, and finally, the Jim Dannys were practicing, so I had to stop in and talk with their director, Mr. Sloatman, about his program. Um, Jim Dandies has over 200 students that practice and perform with the club. Practices, practices are usually once a week after school, but certain students have practices twice a week, depending on their level of performance. Um, this program heavily relies on help from middle school and high school students who participate in Jim Dandies. Um, and they come down to volunteer. Also, parent volunteers help out with this program. Um, students <laughs> learn how to unicycle, juggle scarves and tennis balls, and also spin plates. And at more advanced levels, kids can walk on stilts and balance on globes. Um, the director believes that this program teaches students so much more than just circus tricks, and it teaches them that um, practice can make anything possible, which is a really great mentality for mm -hmm. students to have as they further their education. Um, their ad work, hard work has brought them to performances across Maine and the East Coast. Um, they participated in different parades, including the Mason <laughs> Parade, which was a couple years ago. Um, and they also performed in Barack Obama's second inauguration, which was really nice. Awesome. And so, like I said, I have an update. Um, as of <laughs> December 20th, grades K through 5 all now have silverware. Woo. And it, we're on track by the end of the month to have the middle school awesome. implemented, and next month the high school will be getting it. Congratulations. Awesome. And one of, one of the big things that keep coming up as we meet more about this is the amount of money we'll save in reducing trash, because apparently trash is really expensive. <laughs> 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 so um, on top of everything else, we're also saving money. So like, Win -win. it's pretty exciting. And there are lots of different students and families and staff who have been coming up to us and telling us different stories about it. And as Hillary keeps saying, she keeps hearing tons of stories about the silverware. <laughs> um, on December 13th, the chorus, concert band, and acapella groups all performed at a holiday concert directed by Renee Richardson and Patrick Volker. Um, it was a fantastic concert for anyone who got a chance to go. I always love going to those. They, they do an amazing job for the short time they have for the next concert. It, those concerts, if you ever get a chance, I highly recommend going. They have a ton in the spring. <laughs> um, and then one last thing, although I know it's already in all of your calendars for high priority, on <laughs> January 11th, the Scarborough Band Boosters will be hosting their Scarborough's Got Talent. That's, this, that's next Friday, I believe, if I have my calendar correct. Um, so be sure to go. There will be plenty of students participating in that. It is, what is it? I think it's at uh, Friday night. Does it say the time on there? It does it not. Says, yeah. It does not. All right, we'll just show up at a time. I think it's 7 o'clock. I think it's 7 o'clock. But yeah. it's probably already in your calendar, so you would know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so please. Come and join them for that. Uh, all the proceeds will be going to the Scarborough Band Program. There will be an MC, different awards, and judges. So it'll be kind of fun. And that's all I have. You can keep it up. Thank you. Okay. Oh, sorry. 7.0 now is the superintendent's required 7.1 enrollment update. Yes. So as I like to do monthly, um, here are enrollment numbers. And so again, you can see that um, our enrollment has, well, you can't see this, but our enrollment has gone down just slightly, I think by like one student since last month. The high school is down one student. Um, middle school gained two new students. Wentworth lost a student. And then um, Blue Point lost two students also. <clears throat> so I guess that would mean we're down two students. Um, and this is comparing again to the previous or the current, I would say, enrollment projection study, long range enrollment projection study. As you know, I keep promising you the update is coming. Um, and I believe at our next workshop, um, we have scheduled for the consultant to come and share that report with you. So you'll see the way um, the projections are shifting. It's 
probably much like you anticipated, but um, looking forward to sharing that all with you as I just started really reviewing it. Actually, what are those tiny marks next to the numbers? I that, can't tell on my screen. That's plus or minus how many students oh. at each phase level, so no change at eight corners or plus and how. That was just for my little cheat sheet. Um, so the next thing that I wanted to share with the community and you as a board tonight is the um, ESSA report cards, which is the, uh, every actually it's the main Department of Education report cards, but it's a requirement for the Every Student Succeeds Act, which we've been talking about. This is what replaced new, No Child Left Behind. And so the idea is that the, the state is producing these report cards that, um, pr that communicate information on these five indicators as you see here and I brought a sample for you all to see um, and we'll talk a bit about what you'll see in this so I apologize for the paper in advance but I thought it would be <clears throat> easier than toggling back and forth and there's a couple extras if you, Kristen you want to hand them out to the crowd there's a few for them so um, basically the purpose of this system is to inform state school and community leaders of both the successes and the challenges that exist within our public schools. And I bolded this part, this language comes right from the documents that the state has produced. And I think they're doing a really great job with this. Um, they've given us the chance now, so we as principals and school and district leaders have been able to see the actual report cards prior to the public release, which will happen next week, I believe, if they stay on track with that. Um, and what this, what this does, you can see the five indicators there. It, it really is a way for us to monitor and keep ourselves more accountable, accountable. And they're using these five indicators as sort of the benchmark indicators. And so I think one of the things that's really important for us to understand is this, as these report cards come out for the first time is that this is really a, ben, a baseline assessment. Um, the state is looking at the 2016 test results, 2017 test results, 2018 test results to um, provide us with some indicators of our success and where we are meeting with the state expectations and also where we need to grow. Um, and so the next thing I'm going to pass to you, well just on this handout that I gave you here, it shows um, kind of what those indicators are. And of course, at the high school level, there's, there's the four-year graduation rate and then also the five and the six-year graduation rate. Um, and it's really making sure that we're focusing on all students. We talk all the time. Our mission's very clear that we are working to ensure success for all students. And an important piece of that is making sure that <laughs> we're looking at the data to monitor how are we serving all students. And those subgroups are going to be really important. So we're looking at demographic subgroups. Um, such as you know racial and ethnic sub student groups. We're also looking at socioeconomic status. So are we serving our economically disadvantaged students as well as our um, more uh, advantaged students? And we were, we're looking at our English language learners as a subgroup and then students with disabilities. And the idea is that everyone needs to be making progress and every subgroup needs to be meeting state expectations. And so the next thing um, I'll show, and so it's in color up here, but I, I printed it in black and white just to be um, more fiscally responsible. Um, what you'll see is this is kind of an overview of what the report card will actually look like. And so it's a two-sided report card that um, our goal is to send a cover letter to families, sort of boiling this down um, in somewhat simplistic language so that they can navigate it and understand what it is they're looking at. Um, because I'm anticipating it will get some big reactions given that this is the first time that we're presenting our data in this way. And um, I also anticipate that there will be opportunities, a lot of opportunities for improvement. And so we want to just kind of make sure that folks are aware that this is coming out and um, that it, it's going to um, also allow us to be able to access additional support. So in the first handout, it showed that tier support system, which I'll reference a little bit later on. But you'll notice that it says all schools are eligible for general support from the Department of Education. And that's going to be important as we look at some of the different indicators here. So this is really the cover page um, of the two-sided document. And so it's, I think what's what I really like about this is how visual it is, and so you can get 
um, a brief overview of sort of how is my school doing or how is our district doing um, in, a, in a real quick, you know, kind of one minute picture. So each school will show the number of students. Um, it shows the number of schools in the district. This is a district sample, so obviously it'll look a little different from the schools. The total number of teachers, and then um, the part that I think uh, many folks in our community will be interested in is looking at that pure pupil spending. And so when you look at the individual schools, it shows in the bold, it's how much is this school spending per pupil, and then it shows the state average, and it shows the district average. And so from an instructional equity standpoint, even us looking at how much are we spending per pupil per school, and is there um, some disparities there. The other side of it, just to go back for a second, um, as you can see, it breaks down the demographics. So we're looking at you know gender, we're looking at ethnicity, um, we're looking at the, um, the overall academic proficiency in ELA, math, and science, and it, again, it shows us compared to the district and compared to the state. And so I think that, you know, that's part of our annual reporting, but it's just another way to view it. And then that sidebar where it says school highlights, each of our building principals had the opportunity to submit their own language there and to pick the categories in which they wanted to highlight for their schools. Um, and so they had the opportunity to do that earlier in the fall and submitted that to the DOE. So part of this private process where the district gets to review it is just proofing that and making sure it says what we thought it said. Um, we get to double check that. It also highlights um, the professional qualifications of our teachers. And so that's something that we've done before in some of our public presentations, particularly around the time that the contract was approved last time. So I'm excited to have that really <coughs> and available to our community. So this is the report card. Um, it's just that quick overview. Remember, the purpose is just to help us identify what areas we need to improve. And then we also have the ability to dig in deeper and look more specifically. Um, our goal is not only to look at how are we doing compared to the state, how are we doing compared to other districts um, that we aspire towards or that are, are like us in terms of demographics and funding, but to also look at how are we doing for every single student. And that's the work of our district. Our, our first district goal this year is to really have that overall district-wide improvement process where we're looking at evidence to determine where are we successful and where can we improve. Um, and I think that it's going to be, I think it's going to be pretty eye-opening for some folks. Julie, does the district get a report card in total and then each school? Yep. And then you can pull any other school and any other district from the state? That's the plan. So it's a little slow right now. We're able to get into the, um, into the portal and it takes a while for some of the, the images to load. I know that they're still editing it because when I look at the district overview, you can hover over things. So you could like hover over that orange schoolhouse and it would give you a description of, of what that means. And right now they, they all reference chronic absenteeism, which isn't obviously accurate. So um, they're still working on a few tweaks on the back side of the department. So this is the, the, the four point scale. If you will. Um, they're looking at what does it mean to be emerging? And so this is when that um, a school scores at this level um, to indicate, I think I have descriptors for you, um, that, the sport, that the school has not, it needs support in order to move toward the state expectations. The developing means that the school is moving towards the state expectations. The meeting or teal color there says obviously that we're meeting the state expectations and then the purple is excelling state expectations. And this breaks down those five indicators for you. So you can see, well, so what does that mean to be emerging when it comes to chronic absenteeism or developing? What does it mean to be um, emerging or developing or meeting or excelling when it comes to academic progress in ELA? And so these are the school level descriptors for you. And so again, this is sort of like the high level big overview. And then our job in the schools is to dig deeper and get down to the individual classroom level, student level um, as well. Does the state offer, um, I was just looking at this, does the state offer intervention or support if you don't, if you're emerging at 
certain levels, or do you have to be an overall? Yeah, so that's the, the next thing that I'll, get, I'll share with you. And you're, we're going to need multiple presentations on this. I think that we should also do some community outreach and have presentations for families to understand it, because it's, it, it's a, a complex accountability system, but they've done a really nice job of creating communication tools. So when we send the reports out to all families, there's um, some nice one-pagers that the DOE has created, and they're also creating like frequently asked questions documents. So the website really is, even at this moment, you can go to the Department of Ed website and it's really informative. It seems really user-friendly as it well. Is. Yep. It's, they're trying to make it very intuitive. Um, and so this is the tier support system, um, not to be confused with RTI, but it's kind of like RTI for those of you who are educators in the room, which is response to intervention. So tier one um, basically articulates the need for some support. So if you go back to that very first handout, the one that looks like this, um, that's additional targeted support. So that means that any school that's tier one, which every school is going to be one of these tiers or district, um, they're eligible for regional learning opportunities for educators. And the state has already started providing some really good professional, free professional development or low cost professional development around like digital citizenship and um, infusing that in like physical education. Um, so they're trying to really make some uh, cross-curricular connections for, for schools and um, for educators. And that's one thing that I just is on the top of my mind that's coming up soon. So if you're tier one, that means that you get additional targeted supports and interventions. If you're tier two, um, they, the schools can have support from a school leadership coach and they're eligible for regional learning opportunities for educators. So you get all of tier one and this additional layer of coaching. Um, and then if a school is, um, targeted as tier three, they get the comprehensive support and intervention, which means they get the leadership coach, they also get um, access to the regional learning opportunities, and they're eligible for access to some additional federal funding. What that means yet, we're not quite sure, um, but MSMA has already sent out um, four districts who are um, categorized as tier three talking points to help their community understand what that means. Um, and what I would say is the, the first thing we should all be thinking about is don't panic. Like, this is the baseline. This is new information. Um, and think of it as an opportunity to grow. So no matter what tier we end up on, once the data is finalized, we just it gives us a place to, to start and to think strategically. Um, and I think the timing is really great. Um, given that we'll be, you all will be looking at the mission and the vision and setting um, some new goals and things for the district, and this will provide a really good structure for to keep it student centered and have us really thinking about how do we ensure that all really means all, because it, you're not gonna, we're not going to get by by just being a high performing school district. It's really saying are all of our subgroups high performing? Are we really meeting the needs of all of our kids? Julie, can I? Do you know how this compares to programs that exist in other states in terms of keeping Maine schools competitive? And So this reminds me a, a bit of the Massachusetts accountability system. It's far less complex um, in terms of the way that the data is being shared and calculated. Um, but I, I think that that was a model that they were looking closely at when they developed this. Now, in terms of comparability, I think that's really dependent upon what standards the state adopts and what assessments we use to determine because this is really heavily reliant on that one moment in time, that one state test currently. Um, but it also does look at some other factors like chronic absenteeism, which we know is a, is a strong predictor of student success. I have a question about that. Sure. Um, so the state's obviously being uh, much more deliberate and how they track chronic absenteeism. And seems to be some, you know, they're, they're upping up the ante in terms of school accountability and district accountability mm -hmm. for that. So I'm wondering, um, as we move forward through that and we look at what our chronic absenteeism numbers might look like, um, how are we utilizing things like Power School to track some really good data about mm -hmm. why students are out? Because not all absences are the same. So if a family takes, 
um, a student out for five days during the school year to go on a vacation, which is their prerogative, are we marking that absence based on that? So when we look at the attendance mm -hmm. record, we know that five of the days that student was out was because of a family sponsored vacation. Similarly for a medically excused absence. Yeah. So, and because it, it just looking at an absence in power school doesn't tell the whole picture of, of what it means to be chronically absent. So those are really great questions and we're, um, so the answer I guess would be yes and no or in progress. So number one in the state's eyes, absenteeism is absenteeism. So whether you're out because you're on a family vacation or you're medically um, unable to attend school or you know you decided to sleep in. It, if you're absent, you're absent and that counts towards our chronic absenteeism rate, um, which is you know, another piece that we really need to engage and educate our community around because the reality is if you're not in school, you can't learn. However, we also know that there's high value of family students traveling and being on family vacations and there's a lot of skills and knowledge they can gain from that. One of the things we do right now is we code things excused and unexcused um, in power school. And so that's not very helpful when we're looking at our chronic absenteeism, because we do, we have a chronic absenteeism issue in the district. Um, and there's lots of assumptions like, oh, it's because our families go on a lot of vacations. Well, how do we know? How do we know if that assumption is accurate? Um, and is that true for all of our students who are chronically absent or is that true for a certain subgroup? Are, you know, are there certain demographics that we can look at connected to that absenteeism? So Joanne is actually leading a um, attendance uh, and truancy mm -hmm. committee mm -hmm. that we put together when we started doing the comprehensive needs ass assessment in the spring to you know, begin to educate our leadership team around chronic absenteeism and what does that mean and what are the implications of it um, and to begin digging into our own data. And so one of the things they are looking at are, is can we code things? Yes, to the state we still have to report excused and unexcused. Um, but can internally, can we code them differently so that we have a better, more cleaner story? Um, well, and it helps us to know our kids and, and why they're out, and then how can we develop support systems to increase their attendance at school. Yeah. And One thing the committee has been looking at is what are our practices from each school, mm -hmm. and how are we going to become mm -hmm. one school district with having the same practices in each school, same kind of letters that go home, making people more aware of what your child is absent, if they're not there, they can't learn. How many vacations you might have taken this year, you know, when you have someone who's been out 28 days because they've gone on four or five vacation, it really impacts uh, their learning because uh, 28 days is almost five and a half weeks of school. Right. And looking at the younger grades yes. moving mm -hmm. forward because we all know that habits start early, so if That's you have exactly. a chronic absentee right. issue in first grade, it's going to translate through unless there's some intervention. Right. That's exactly what we're looking at. That's the awesome. younger grades are coming up and, and educating parents. We're also doing a book study. Um, I think it's it's not uncommon for people to think initially, well, what can we do about absenteeism? You know, we can't make the kids come to school. Well, right, we can't, but we can <coughs> educate families around what are the what's the impact of you having a home day, um, or you know, having a home day once a month, having a home day every other week. Um, even if it's for family reasons and there's lots of other benefits, that leads to chronic absenteeism. And I think one of the things that was a noticing for us in our, in our just initial first re chapter that we were reading was the um, impact that having a chronically absent student in your class can have on all the other students and the, the way that affects relationships and social emotional development. Um, so I think it gives us a lot to think about um, and certainly an opportunity to really help parents understand. Um, I'll speak personally for my own family where my husband likes to have a home day often with my daughter who's just a preschooler but early attendance is a strong indicator of later attendance um, and sharing with him just like the impact that has on her and her classmates and I think it um, has been eye-opening for both of us just to understand that even as a, as a preschooler mm -hmm. what we can do to intervene and create better practice. Hmm. Any other comments? <clears throat> Sorry. Um, the only thing I'll add is that um, what I love about this <laughs> scorecard and also this conversation that's come out of it is very similar to, and I just called it this, the, the college scorecard that all 
federally funded institutions, whether they're public or private, get. If we don't have an option, we get it funded, no we have a choice. And the data in there is very aggregated, but what you have as an institution, and for us as a district, is the chance to disaggregate that information mm -hmm. and to dig down to what our own district um, takeaways are. So just an absenteeism figure on its own, okay, yeah, that's interesting, maybe it's good, maybe it's bad, but taking it apart and figuring out what that means by disaggregating is, is something that's huge in higher ed right now, and it's exciting to see it coming to the secondary ed arena, so, so thank you. Yeah, and I think um, part of this journey for us at, in becoming more data-wise as a district is really making sure that we don't jump right up to, you know, that high on that ladder of assumptions and we start truly at the ground level of just like what did we notice about the data like what does it actually say and then what do we wonder even when we do that ourselves as a board when um, Monique and Kathy facilitated that it was really easy to get to well it's probably because of this and this and I think it's because of that and that and you want to just first like stay really low and um, we'll have lots of opportunities to practice that both as a board but also with our staff okay. All right. Thank you. So, and I'm going to apologize in advance for A, if it fades in and out or whatever. Um, similar to last month, I have, I'm a big fan of motivational quotes. And this one I came across the other day from Henry Ford that coming together is a beginning, keeping together is progress, and working together is success. And that really struck with the first policy committee meeting that we had. Um, walking into it, we really were able to start working together, and from the feedback I'm getting from other committees, it's not an unusual experience. It's, we're coming together and we're actually making a difference, and it just means so much, so thank you. Okay, workshops. Um, there's been a lot of comment recently about the number of workshops that we've had as a board. We've had three. Um, the second meeting of the month, we will always have a workshop. It starts at 6 o'clock prior to the business meeting. Um, we had one tonight as well in order to have MSMA come in and talk about the superintendent search, which undoubtedly is going to be the largest undertaking of the year for this board. Um, and to be respectful of our students, if we had started at 7 o'clock with MSMA, had an hour, and then started, our students are looking a little after 9 o'clock and we're not halfway through the agenda. And that's really not fair to you guys. Um, you know, we want to make sure that you're getting home and you're getting adequate sleep. Um, if you have studying to do, you can get it underway. So we will have workshops starting prior to business meetings. Changes to the agenda, um, and this is for both board and the public. Um, we're really making a concerted effort to publish the agenda a week in advance. That said, things change, it's a little fluid. Things may not fall in the way that we had hoped for, so we might have to make modifications. It's not being done because we're disorganized or we're not being pulled together. It's that we're learning a cadence. It's the fourth agenda so far for the team. We don't necessarily know how far are we going to get through pieces. Um, it'll get better with time. I apologize that it has not been as smooth as maybe in the past, but we're getting there. Um, also, I owe everybody an update on where we stood with the team building opportunity with town council. I had an <coughs> opportunity <coughs> sorry, to speak with Carol Martin, who would be the facilitator. She sounds fantastic. The opportunity is great. Um, the ability to work through how we would collaborate, especially going into budget, is incredible. Um, that said, there are still some additional questions regarding the format, how the formatting will work, and really understanding what the cost is to the board. Um, the projections are a little open-ended, so we really need to bring that into something that is consistent or substantial enough to come back for a motion to the board, but I just wanted to let you know where we stood with it. And lastly, um, team drive access. The team drives are in place. We mentioned that at our last meeting. Um, again, this is huge for us. It's going to give us a digital footprint um, as well as have historical information for new board members as they come on. Um, there's three levels of access. We have a manager level and you can see what they're able to do. Um, and that's Sean Bushway who is our webmaster, Kelly and Julie. Content managers are Nick, myself and Joanne. And contributors are the board members and Colt. 
Um, one of the pieces that I just really wanted to kind of work through with everyone is looking at how that content is again managed and do we all have the adequate or correct access to the system. Um, one of the pieces that I was a little concerned about was in that second piece, moving files and folders within the drive and into the trash. Um, moving the files and folders, that's important is being able to get, you know, how do I reorganize this? Is it not set up correctly? I don't want to have to delete my work and start over. Um, so yes, I see that having a ton of value. However, Google being its brilliant design, it also means that you can delete things and put things into the trash. And after 30 days, that trash is emptied and it's lost. Um, there is risk with that, and I understand why the conservative approach was taken on how um, access was granted. But I really wanted to open this up to conversation to the board on, you know, should we be all at the same level in content manager <clears throat> as we work through the drive? Well, one of the reasons that I wanted to bring this up again is because um, just what you exactly what you just said. Um, we just learned about it at the last meeting. We talked about it a little bit, but I hadn't been in there to use it. And one of the things that is really frustrating is that I can't, I can create a new folder, but I can't put anything in it. <laughs> so I can take things from my, my, I can take things from my desktop or my drive and add it in there. But once it's in there, I can't say, oh shoot, I actually wanted that in like the communications folder as opposed to the policy folder. I can't move stuff from one place to, to another. I can't take, um, like, <coughs> like I, I created the communications folder, I took all my stuff from my drive and put it in there, and then I went through to make subfolders, like the Spotlight Award and all this. I can't put anything in them. From your, from your <coughs> shared drive. Right. Okay. It's frustrating. Yeah. So now we have everything in one big communications folder. But we can't organize. But it's not organized. <laughs> like we can't put then all the spotlight award clips into a folder because we don't have access to move them. So I think you can all be content managers. The I think the issue is that third point where you can permanently delete the trash and you can add and remove members or modify the drive settings. And that is really the the advice of the IT. Um, well, Sean as our webmaster, and he's also the one who sets up the team drives. Like, even I can't set up a team drive. I have to ask Sean to set it up. And then he goes through and he says, okay, what do you, who are the people, what kids should they be able to be able, what should they be able to do and not be able to do? Um, and so I think it's just a matter of getting clear about what we want now that you've had a chance to try, to try it out. And mm -hmm. um, I, I don't see any issues with you all being content managers because <coughs> it's super frustrating to not be able to. Yeah, my other question is, is is that permanently delete trash, does that mean that you can remove stuff from the Google Vault? Yes. That was my question. So, That's my I just, the, that was the other thing I wanted to discuss. I don't really think anyone should be able to do that. Like, I think Sean, I mean, we should be able to say, okay, Sean, like, we've all agreed we want to permanently remove this from the vault, but there's a big difference between deleting something off the drive and then deleting it off the vault. I'm sorry. I, I was under the impression from Kelly's presentation last time that no one could delete anything from the vault. I thought the vault was the vault. I'm thinking of Seinfeld here, the vault. You know, like no one could take it out. So, I mean, th that's kind of like, that was how I left it. So I don't, if that is really the case, then it's not really that big of a risk for all of us to be content managers on the top of our head. But that's just my right. thought. Well, content manager can't permanently, permanently right. delete any, anything. Well, a content manager can delete... You can delete oh, it. Oh, into the trash. You can, delete, yes. you can put it in the yeah. trash. You can delete it. You just can't permanently delete it. Got it, got it, got it. it. <laughs> okay. And the, so there's, Leanne and I were talking about this earlier. There's pros and cons. It's just like, you know, when you make the decision, am I going to create this in Word or am I going to create this in Google? You mm -hmm. know that creating it in Google, there's added benefits, but there's also limitations, mm -hmm. right, for anyone who kind of uses both those platforms. And the same thing is true with a team drive versus a regular share drive. So with a regular share drive, there's a lot more flexibility and autonomy, and everybody has access to decide who's going to edit and who's going to comment. And um, within the team drive, it's more restrictive, also because it allows you to invite people from outside your organization, which you can do in share drive too, um, but it allows them to have more open access to it. And so we're this team drives are really new to us. We just gained access, 
return of Joe, what was it? Two well, months ago. The beginning of the school year, because yeah. we started using them with PLTs. Um, and so I won't say like we're experts on using no, them, but, but I know that there are benefits and limitations to it. The one major benefit is that you know, in the past, as board members, if you were chair of communications, you would create the folder and you'd, you know, share documents and things like that. But then when that person's off the board, unless they switch ownership to someone else, you're, they're not able to have that. And so I know that was a question sort of, well, isn't there some sort of system? It's like, yeah, there's a system, but there's not a good transition plan. And this allows for a good transition plan as yeah. board members and that, come and go. And that's why I think working through the the hurdles and the team drive and just kind of persevering and moving forward is the way to go because, mm -hmm. and I'll speak to that a little bit when we talk about policy, um, it was really difficult to come in to um, a board and not have access to any kind of institutional board work. Um, and I know that work was done, but to not be able to have access to that <laughs> was a challenge. Mm -hmm. So this team drive allows us to develop a board institutional memory for future boards and um, you know an archive system where we can go and we can track um, things that happened and policies that were changed and yeah so this is our school board team drive mm -hmm. and I think we've kind of created like an uncomfortable hierarchy where we as equal board members don't have the same access that the chair, vice chair, and Joanne have, which I, I don't I don't see why that you would need a, a higher level of accessibility than the, the rest of us, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Agreed. Um, so I would also say that you guys should be as a content manager. I think it was really intended as a you know let's get in, let's sure. let's test the water. Mm -hmm. um, again, Google really is not the friendliest of platforms. <gasps> Just being honest, <laughs> um, you know it, it's got it's got some great tools, but it's got some to Julie's point major limitations. Um, so I would highly recommend that everybody get moved to the same level. Great. I also would like to point out that with team drives, um, none of the school systems that we work with or you know uh, have meetings with came on with team drives until probably last June. And so it was the first time I think in June when we got introduced to um, <laughs> working with other school districts, having a team drive, and most schools weren't up and ready yet with team drives, and it just is getting started. I think our school system, and talking with two other schools, we have a lot more team drives set up than they do. Okay. Yeah, I think that's great. Um, so is there any way that we can have that highest level as the, as the manager only be our webmaster, so that everything kind of has to go through him to yeah. do that permanent delete and to add people and remove people? I think you want to have some, what we've learned is that when you have one person in an organization who has the knowledge and the access, then when that person goes, there's not a good mm -hmm. handoff. So I think okay. that you should have, I think it should be Kelly as the primary with Sean and, who, and the superintendent. I think that's really important to keep that structure. Um, and But I don't see I would hesitate about having Sean, and not for anything, because I think Sean's fantastic. He's probably, he's brilliant. He's fixed so many things for me. Um, but where he also manages everything with a school, as far as a webmaster and everything with a town, it's going to get hard if we need to make changes or we need assistance <coughs> to only have one person who can right. add somebody. Um, I think having additional bodies, not only for the share of knowledge, but for ensuring that things are done really timely, is invaluable. I think what's making me uncomfortable is that in terms of like accountability and FOA, it doesn't make me, I don't, I don't think anyone should be able to delete off the vault. <laughs> well, let me find out. Okay, yeah, that's, a, that's good. I don't know that, if that's what that means. Um, okay. That's a whole different level of access. Fair. Yeah, that's, I just, that I, like I guess that. I want clarification <laughs> on that. Okay. Yeah. Mm. Fair enough. So just to recap, I'm hearing everyone as content managers and find out what permit moves to be trash. Yes. Okay. 
Yes, please. <coughs> I don't, I mean, does Colt need to? Does Colt need to be able to move folders and things like yeah. that? No. I meant okay. everyone like everyone. Everyone on the board. Okay, that's yeah. fine. That's what I thought. Yeah. Colt is central office leadership team. So right. We're not supposed to use jargon. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Hillary. Mm -hmm. I have really tried hard <laughs> not to use those acronyms <laughs> and I It's hard. I failed. <laughs> They're so <laughs> cute. <laughs> Nine point oh committee reports. <clears throat> Communications. Uh, okay, so um, we had our most recent and actually our first meeting as a group. It's um, Sarah, April, and myself on December thirteenth. Um, we did kind of an overview and um, a bit of a discussion on a lot of the ongoing product products <laughs> projects. Um, the Spotlight Award, we kind of came to the conclusion we would continue that for the remainder of the pilot, which was kind of this school year, and um, reassess it after that. The district newsletter, um, we also um, decided to keep going with that. Um, we, we thought we would do around four more issues um, and then reassess, and some we can use some of the tools um, from the way we send it out. We can kind of see um, like who clicks who clicks on the link, who opens it, that kind of thing, we would be able to use some of those metrics to be able to decide whether it was worth the time and effort. Um, I just really quickly have a link to the most recent newsletter. Um, it came in the, e in, oops, I just did it on my own computer and I'm not, I'm not gonna <laughs> can you link that? Um, so it came over email to um, anybody who's on the district um, <coughs> mailing list, so parents and staff. Um, and then we also put it out um, here at Town Hall and it's up at Central Office in paper copies. Um, it just gives some overview to um, like more district-wide. I know everybody gets updates from their schools specifically and teachers. Um, so it's about, what is it, four pages. Mm -hmm. um, it just has some information um, district-wide. Um, so if you like it or don't like it, give us an email. Let us know. Did you put some paper copies at the public library? Did we this time? I, I can do that, Joanne. Yeah. I don't think we did. That might be a good place. You to know that I have mm -hmm. I have issues printing out the paper copies. Yes, you were Frankensteining <laughs> we, them together <laughs> last I time. Didn't. <laughs> but they are printed, and they and I, I'll go look on my way out and see they if they were there. Look, but I'll put them at the library. Let's see if they come up. Yeah. Oh, good. Okay. Okay. I have a question about the click throughs. Yeah. Are you? able to track whether or not somebody has multiple addresses because I get it three times I don't know and I would hate to think that if I read it on one you email one child? you know it's magical <laughs> I have three kids and I get it once well I get it through, <laughs> well, I get it on the board email and oh. then I have my personal emails oh, because I had yeah. a primary oh. and a backup um, so I'm getting it three times but I'm only reading it once and I wouldn't want those numbers right. to skew and make it look as though you weren't getting the readership. I think it's more about your accessing it through your through your parent email. And we, we have to really look at that and see how we can yeah. okay. through spy can tell who's open. You can tell who's open it. So that I might need to switch and do it through something else. Okay. Now don't go everybody just clicking <laughs> on it so you're not on Kelly's list. <laughs> we want you to actually read it. Um one of the other things we talked about um was our upcoming fiscal year 20 budget and the communications that um, we're going to use for that, whether we're going to <coughs> continue with things that we've done in the past or have any new ideas, um, that kind of thing. We also um, are going to help with, like, I use the word translate, but kind of um, unpacking the um, ESSA report. Um, Julie had talked about a little bit, like, talking to parents, what does this mean, how, you know, how do we want to view this, or what, you know, basically what does this mean for us, what does it mean for our schools, um, so we are going to help out with that, um, and then um, the last thing that we talked about, and this is kind of a big discussion, so we wanted to open it up to the full board, um, and Julie touched on this a little bit at the very beginning when you were talking about <laughs> the recognitions, um, 
So there is a district-wide communications committee um, that, she, uh, like you were saying, it has 20 people, you know, it's the, um, um, instructional coaches, um, and then, right, a bunch of um, teachers, high school teachers. Uh, I'm on it, Julie's on it, Leanne's on it. Anyway, um, one of the things that we, that group is trying to do is really streamline um, where people are getting their information um, so that you're really only going to one place. Um, so one of the things that we discuss, and I'm actually going to turn this over to April to give us some of our um, some of our rationale, was merging our Facebook page from the, as the school board with the Scarborough Public Schools Facebook page, um, and what the benefits and deterrents to that are. And then we wanted to open it up to everybody sure. for the discussion. So, <coughs> so we all know that you know. Communicating with the public is a priority for this board. Um, but we also know the nature of Facebook. And I think right now we are finding ourselves at a place where we do not have a set of protocols in place to interact and engage with people on Facebook. Um, as it stands right now, Leanne as chair is um, solely responsible to respond to emails. And so in keeping with that protocol, um, to me, that would mean that Leanne would need to be responding with people via Facebook. Um, and so as it stands right now, we post um, simply the agenda um, is what we have been using Facebook to share just our agenda. In the past, the Facebook page has been used to share community events, um, however, if we are using the Facebook page to conduct board business, then sharing community events is great and we want the community to be well informed, but it creates a lot of, a lot of redundancies with other organizations' Facebook pages and it's virtually impossible to decide what we're gonna pick and choose and share and as a result, you know, certain groups may feel slighted or that we're not putting enough emphasis on you know, one group or this group. Um, and with so many district events taking place, this idea of a central community school Facebook page, you know, where everything is kind of streamlined and everyone is able to post to that, and, the, and that would include the school board. Um, and so, there, like I said, there are a few problems that we have with Facebook. Um, number one, that when someone question, asks us a question, um, we are really trying as a board to encourage people to email um, there's a lot of liability, as we learned in the um, last um, workshop when we had Ella here, that there's a lot of liability about interacting with people um, on Facebook, and I don't personally want to be responsible for deciding what comments get to stay and which comments get, you know, are inappropriate, and there's no, it, there's a lot of gray area for us um, with that form of communication. Um, and then the flip side of that coin is, we want to be approachable. We want people to be able to communicate with us and feel like they have a good means to reach us, um, but Facebook might not be the appropriate channel. And the fact that that Facebook page exists um, kind of sends mixed signals to the community that that would be a good place to reach us. And then obviously that's not a very fulfilling relationship when someone asks us a question and just sits there for a week. Um, and I did see that feedback and I know that that frustration exists. Um, but until we decide as a group how we want to handle um, those interactions, I did not feel comfortable making any kind of unilateral decisions over the last couple of weeks about how I was going to respond to people on Facebook. So if you have posted something on Facebook and you have felt frustrated, um, I apologize. Um, we are working the kinks out as we go. Mm -hmm. So we talked about this um, at length in communications committee. And the recommendation of the communication committee to the board is that we discontinue use um, of our personal Facebook page and merge with the larger um, school district Facebook page to um, share board business, which in, you know, for most cases is posting the agenda. The one, the one thing I would also add is I, I think that it's, 
about <laughs> streamlining too so that people don't have to check multiple sources for information. That's why we have chosen to use the if this then that, that app connection is so that if you're a Twitter user, you can be getting information on Twitter. If you're a Facebook user, the same information is there. Um, what we aren't able to do yet is to have it go back the other way. So we're looking at other extensions that might allow us to be able to do that. But um, I think this is a really smart recommendation. I think it will help you communicate better and more clearly with the community. Um, and I, I also would just add that the district Facebook page, when I first came to the district, was the superintendent's page. Um, and that we transitioned that when we kind of solidified our branding guidelines to make it a district page so that it could be more inclusive. And we're you know, opening up access so that more folks can post things on there as well because we want to be telling our story better and have everyday evidence of what's happening in our schools. So that's where we want Facebook users to come to that page and I think it helps if they're not going to multiple. And I also want to point out one of the other things is that um, you know, my demographic, like 40-something mom uses Facebook, but a lot of the parents of the younger students who, um, they don't even know how to use Facebook and they're using Instagram or Twitter. Um, so I think that to have, um, to have our page merged with the district page, which then is gonna feed into um, the, the Twitter page and then also into the Instagram, which we don't have yet, but is on the docket, um, I think is probably going to cover more of our community than just having, a, you know, a board Facebook page and then a district Facebook page that links to a district Twitter. But you, I don't know. I just I feel like it's a little bit more uh, encapsulated. So I don't. So, so it's your your proposal is that the Scarborough Board Facebook page would be closed and it would be consolidated instead with what was formerly the superintendent's Facebook page and it's now the Scarborough District's um, Facebook page. How is that going to change any of your concerns about commenting and privacy and legality of posting? Well, so one of the one of the benefits to us is that there are protocols and procedures being developed for the district page and a set of norms for posting um, and the this 20 person committee is working on those as opposed to just our internal communications committee trying to make those decisions um, and so to some extent we are at the will of what the district um, committee decides to do and how they decide to handle that um, but it does um, shift that from uh, it being solely our responsibility to establish those norms is there a way that you can just shut down the comments so that you don't worry about you know violating FERPA or something like that <clears throat> in, in, on the Facebook page so there's three options um, on on Facebook specifically in terms of what type of form it can be. It can be a closed form where you have no comments. Um, it can be a semi-closed form where certain comments are allowed, but there's also limitations on word choice and things like that. And there can be a completely open forum. And so our district page is a semi-closed forum um, because we're not actually allowed to completely shut down the comments. And, well, in fact, there's some conflicting legal advice about whether or not you have to have comments or not. Um, and so we chose to err on the side of more, um, more f uh, freedom of speech and having a semi-closed form than having, uh, than having a fully closed form. There are some districts who do, um, but from what we were hearing at the superintendent's conference, we didn't think that that was the best, or the school board conference, that that was the best way to go for our community. So. It's semi-closed. I think the other part of this is really becoming disciplined at um, helping people access <laughs> board um, members and ask questions in a consistent way. You don't want some people to think that they can ask a question or personal message. Like um, I would give an example that sometimes they'll send personal messages to the district Facebook page. 
And so the, what I always do is pick up the phone and call that person because the minute I respond in that way, then that becomes the expectation that this is how we communicate. And it's not intended to be an open forum. It's not intended to be a dialogue. It's intended for us to be able to push out news about the district and information to our community in a really rapid way. And because it's a business page, it also allows us to have a lot of data analytics so we can see like what types of posts are getting the farthest reach. Um, we know, for example, the reason why we asked that we gave the video challenge was because we know that when we post a video, it gets almost three times as much engagement as when we just post a picture. Um, and so you know, that's something that this larger uh, key committee of key communicators is looking at. And so we're trying to say, you know, if we're going to put all this energy into improving communication, we want to make sure we're doing it in an efficient way um, and in an effective way. And we believe that having fewer places for people to go to and really amplifying that communication there is going to lead to better communication across the board. So for those of us that weren't at that conference, what was the concern about closing comments completely? Um, I would say freedom of speech, speech and censorship. On, on the school board's page and, and the ability to ask questions publicly. Mm -hmm. For people to comment mm -hmm. on things or... Um, we yeah. also want people to like things and share things. Right. And, you right. know, that's part of that, like, positive rumor right. vision that I was explaining. It just seems like the most obtuse way to ask a question, so it's surprising when people mm -hmm. try to use that forum as a method to communicate. Um, it's, it's surprising to me. I know that the, the police department has that the same type of thing, you know, mm -hmm. with a, but it has a bolded message, please don't <laughs> ask, you know, right. emergency questions here. Mm -hmm. It seems obvious, but generally it seems like the public engages in that. Yeah, and, and I think the other part of it too, Alicia, is that we just simply don't have staff capacity right. to mm -hmm. have right. somebody monitoring right. the page. Um, and that was really why we wanted to create um, better avenues for a lot of people. We understand that you're compromising quality in some ways because you have more people, you know, publishing information, but we believed that we, the, the sacrifice of quality in order to get quantity of positive posts was, was worth the risk, so to speak. But we don't have somebody who full-time monitors um, our page. Do you, it's me in the wee hours of the night. Do you feel like it's <laughs> premature to go from, if, if the district-wide Facebook page is not fully up with its procedures and that's one of our concerns, do you feel like it's premature to to make that shift now? So I think that this is a logical time to consider the merge, um, for sure, which is why we wanted to bring it up to the full board tonight. Um, I would certainly be open to creating um, some kind of draft document that we could pin to our Facebook page um, for the time being, just basically what you alluded to with the police department saying, you know, this is not, you know the appropriate channel if you have a question like please email and then you can provide the email address um, and pin that to the top of the page and continue to post the agenda but I would like to discuss like a, a hard stop for and, I, and we did yeah. discuss having not just turning <coughs> off one day um, having okay. a date in the future where the merge would be complete yes. and that we would be able to um, post about it maybe on both pages but you know to go like yes. Public and, and creating posts to directing people to the district page mm -hmm. you know could definitely be something that we did leading up to the, the merge sort of like a we're moving have you followed <laughs> us on, yes. you know have you followed the district page yet well I, I think like asking the community to understand that if you have a if you have a question about an agenda item, probably the best way to communicate that is through an email to the board or call our phone numbers that are posted on the website. Mm -hmm. yep. um, because, I mean, Facebook's real time, and if we're not on Facebook, we're not going to see that, perhaps, mm -hmm. but we're, we're obligated to, ch we're checking our email daily because we're members of the board. Right. So, I mean, I, I had someone from the community call me today to, to share feedback and, and have a conversation, you know, and so I, I feel like asking a question about the agenda on Facebook isn't isn't the most efficient way to get you get get your question answered. I mean we had lots of questions come in and, and Leanne addressed them and 
um, was able to, to answer uh, the concerns that the community had. Facebook is probably not the way to, to field those kinds of questions. As part of the consolidation, has the Communications Committee considered a, a BOE alias, if you will? So once there's a district page and we're part of that, would there be a way for the board to post something as the board? So I, I'm, for example, I'm thinking one of the first posts could be, have a question about one of our agendas or what's coming up? Remember to email us at da 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 That would come from a board alias as opposed to from a member. Because that way we could still have a very definitive presence even if it's on a unified district forum. So instead of being Hillary Durgan the says board, blah, blah, blah. I don't think the oh. board page can post to the district page, if that's what you're asking. Yeah, but if you just continue the board page, you would have to have a board account or alias or yeah. whatever. So if you looked at our Facebook now, you can see on the posts, um, like, for example, I don't know if I'm, I'm not completely logged in here. So I think it's on Twitter that you're thinking of with the hashtag of the person. No, it'll say, like, Kelly Johnson posted you know, oh, seven yeah, hours yeah. ago, or Julie Cooper <laughs> posted. But seven only, hours ago. I don't think. I think the only people who can see it are the admins. I don't like that. Yeah, I think yeah. the admins can see that. How long will it be until the district wide um, protocols are established? What's our next meeting, Cal? January, January 29th. We would probably be able to bring them um, to policy at your in your um, February policy meeting. I would imagine. I, I anticipate that on that 29th meeting, that's going to be sort of our focus of thinking about. And it's not we're not creating a policy. We're really just saying Perfect. best practices, Perfect. and we're trying to say like here's here's the kind of posts that we would like you know to encourage you to make. And so giving people sort of like a formula <laughs> for in order to encourage more content creators or story collectors is what um, I keep calling them. And the idea there is just so that there's some, we're, we're reinforcing our big messages, um, which are those four hashtags that we talked about earlier in the meeting. Um, but then I think also, you know, having a, a post that says, have a question for the school board, like we can put, we can make like a meme and put that up every so often once a month as, you know, regular, are you trying to reach a school board member? Don't forget to, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm fully on board with being a content generator, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, for, on behalf of the board for the communications committee. Um, it just, it really is about streamlining it and reducing the redundancy of having our own page with a district page. Um, and as the district page, you know, gains momentum, I think, like I said, this is the logical time for the school board to are you looking for a motion tonight, or do you want to wait and come back with protocols uh, or best practices? Clear on whether we need a motion. Yeah, okay. <laughs> that right. was a question. <laughs> I don't think that you do, okay. um, because that is part of the purview of the communication committee. That's kind of what we were wondering. There's no policy on it currently, right. mm -hmm. so but we we did feel like it was kind of a big um, topic and decision, so we wanted to have that discussion with the. The full board. I, I think that it should be subject to board approval. Um, that's my thought. I think in that, in the name of transparency, having a motion and you know voting on it is a good way for each of you to be able to express your opinion about it, um, while also moving forward in a really transparent way. Okay. okay. I'll make a motion. Thank you. <laughs> um, the heck? Um, I move that the that we authorize moving the board's presence on Facebook away from a separate page and to part of the district page. How's that? Second. That was also okay. Second. Okay. Discussion. My only um, addition to the motion would be to set some kind of time frame. Um, but if not, but not if that doesn't need to be part of the motion. Like if the you can, you can do a friendly amendment to it okay. of adding a date. It's, it's how, how it's phrased. <laughs> sure. Um, then my friendly amendment is that we um, make this switch um, effective February first, two thousand nineteen. Is there a second? I second that. 
assuming that the the protocols are in place for the um, for the other page. I, know, I would almost make it later so okay. that we yeah. have time. I mean, we can always do it earlier, but we, we at least have time because I think Alicia has a good point about having okay. those. How about March 1st? Say March. Okay. Okay. Great. Second. And now more discussion. I guess my thought is that I don't like the I don't I don't like moving forward without knowing what those procedures are, um, understanding what that means, hearing from the community, um, and and whether that will truly reach a greater audience and, and whether that's going to improve our our um, communication. I'm, I, I have concerns about. That. I mean, I, I think it's on us to um, sell the district page mm -hmm. and to communicate with our constituents that that's how we're, you know, we're going to be streamlining all of our information through that public page. I would agree. I think that right now branding um, in Scarborough is strong. Of an, it's strong and it, it needs to be important um, for the foreseeable future. And having everything in one spot really lends to that occurring. So I would be wholly in favor of this. Well, and perhaps having us make this motion tonight, if it were to pass, would also help this group, the larger communications group, see the value of moving forward on these protocols because the board has given them a vote of confidence saying, we're so confident that this is going to be great, we are willing to put our presence in the hands of this group, which has representation from those around the table. So I, I, I think it's great. Okay. Are we ready for a vote? Okay. All those in favor? All those opposed? Okay. Motion passes six, one, and two. Thank you. Thank you. The only last thing I would add is um, if you're not yet following us on Twitter or following the district Facebook page, <laughs> plug, please plug, plug. do so. <laughs> Feel free to like and love all of the posts that our teachers are working hard to get out there. There are some really great um, things to celebrate in our schools. And before I move on from communications, do you want to talk about your next meeting dates? Our next meeting dates are January 7th, 14th, and 28th. Um, and we, yeah. Okay. <laughs> all right. <laughs> what time? Oh, I think they're all at 1.30. Oh. Let me look. Hold on. 1.15. <laughs> <clears throat> One fifteen, one fifteen, and the seventh I think is a different time. The seventh is at four thirty. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Great report. Negotiations. Sure. Um, <coughs> the board will be ready to vote on the bus driver contract later tonight. Uh, the new negotiation negotiations committee did not work on this one, so I just want to take this opportunity to thank all involved um, for their hard work. Uh, we will be entering negotiations with the teachers soon to bargain their next contract cycle. And um, just to um, review, uh, I know we've said this um, before, but the negotiations team members are Amy Glidden as chair, Nicholas Gill, and Hillary Darby. Okay. Thank you. Can, can I just say something? I'd, I'd like to thank um, Mary Starr and Jackie Perry for continuing on and, mm -hmm. and providing us with that, their background information. and. and wrapping that up for our district. Agreed. Um, policy. This one got a little attention this week. Um, so we really want to spend some time talking about what happened in the policy meeting that we had on the 17th. Um, Joanne, if you could explain the uh, staff input to the decision making of the policies that came forward for removal. Okay. So back in September, our nurses had met with um, the policy committee back then and had reviewed and given their rationale for why some of these po policies should be removed. And um, then it got to the new board came on and I don't think they had the background that they, um, from September and from the work they had done in June. And um, so when I spoke with the nurses, and um, why they're not here tonight is that they really felt like they wanted to have a meeting with the policy committee first since it's a new policy committee to review these policies and their rationale and go through that before they came to do a public presentation. Okay. Okay. Um, and piggybacking <coughs> on that, 
they were also involved heavily with bringing forward um, requests to enhance policy ABC, right. which is our current tobacco policy. Um, specifically, really wanting to include the vapor producing products because vaping has become an epidemic. There's no other word for it. Um, it's being recognized at all levels of the government as being a major health crisis that is looming on our horizon very fast. Um, as we got into policy ADC and did a lot of work, um, first I really want to thank both Amy and Alicia for all of the hours over the holiday. Um, we met for an hour and a half. We got through a good portion of it. We had revision upon revision. Um, we were working collaboratively in the team drive. And we got to a point that we felt we were going to be prepared for a first reading. Um, more questions came up as we dug in deeper and realized that we touched JIC, which is our student code of conduct. Um, there are references to JIC and making sure that everything is in alignment, found that we had opened up one heck of a can of worms. Um, that said, we really do need to do some more work on these. Um, the lawyers have been really helpful in providing guidance and feedback, but I really want to be feel that we're in a good spot before we come forward in a first read. Um, Can I just elaborate on that a little bit? Absolutely. Um, <coughs> the, um, the biggest barrier to moving the ADC forward tonight is um, the, the multiple references to handbooks <laughs> in the various school districts in terms of how the schools deal with abuses um, to the tobacco and, and soon to be um, vapor producing product policy. So we wanted to ensure that we had an opportunity to look at those handbooks and let the school staff um, you know, make some edits to how internally the school was going to deal with any kind of um, disciplinary um, action, um, supportive support for counseling services, or whatever that might be. We wanted to make sure that those reflected what the policy would potentially mandate that they do reflect. Oh. <coughs> I apologize. Um, also, we had discussed um, in depth the nurse's um, request for removing the policies. Um, I'm not going to go into all of the reasons that they listed for each one. I am going to hit on the more important of um, the allergies and what their rationale was. Again, we will talk with them further and get more understanding with the new team. Um, but they felt that they address all allergies on an individual basis as a standard of care that students with severe allergies have a health plan and or a 504 plan as needed and appropriate with all necessary accommodations specific to the student, um, and that the policy would be replaced with an updated school protocol. That said, we have heard the feedback. Um, I would love to see the protocols completed before we move forward with that. So again, there's more work to be done on those policies as well before they can come off the books. The, the one thing I would just add is that it's not because the nurses don't yet have protocols in place. They absolutely do have protocols in place. That's what gives them the confidence to remove these policies. It's just a matter of formally writing the protocols up um, in a way that you know the board can review and see. But the nurses are very, anyone who has a child with allergies knows they're very attentive. They are very proactive um, and do a good, really go above and beyond to ensure that all children are safe in our schools. Thank you. That was an important mess that I didn't include. Um, I'd okay. also want to go And on. yes, with that, um, because of the laws that have changed too, more kids have those health plans now mm -hmm. and 504s than they did mm -hmm. nine years ago. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. We had very few 504s nine years ago, maybe mm -hmm. a handful, but now as kids have <laughs> allergies, parents are requesting a 504 or the health plan that they do for all kids. Is it still the case, like, I have a vague memory from from when I was on policy last year that the nurses were worried that the policy would impede them from following the law, is that, 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 that they didn't, um, didn't match up? I think the policy was created prior to, to there the being a law. law. Okay. That, well, the law and the way that it is now and so descriptive. Okay. <clears throat> I've also heard a lot of feedback in the community that um, the way Scarborough handles um, food allergies in our district is very comprehensive mm -hmm. and very proactive. And as um, a mother of a, a recent graduate who, who has a peanut allergy, 
I could speak to that. Um, they were incredibly vigilant in following protocols and processes, and I always really appreciated that. Mm -hmm. They kept me on my toes um, mm -hmm. um, in, tor in terms of making sure the EpiPen was not expired and all that. Um, so I, I think that for me, the barrier um, with what, how this all went down and the concern I have about it is that um, we had our first policy meeting on December 17th. And this was an ask of our nursing staff in September. So there's a misunderstanding out there that the board somehow requested that these policies be removed. And that's not the case. The nursing staff, the health services staff, asked for these policies to, to be removed because of um, the reasons that Joanne just articulated. So at that meeting, I had asked for the nurses to be here tonight so that the community and the new board could hear the background because we did not get any background information about how this went down. Um, so that was important for me to have them come and speak because this was their ask and this was supported by both Joanne and Julie in terms of it being the right move. Um, the, um, so when that didn't happen, I was surprised because I, I assumed when I, when I saw it on the agenda that that was going to happen. So for me, I don't think it ever should have been on the agenda if the nurses weren't going to be here and we weren't going to move forward. So that, that was a problem, and I know it changes, and that's fine, but, but it caused a lot of unnecessary angst, understandably so, in the community. Because I, I would not endorse any um, you know, policy about allergies to be removed unless I knew that there was going to be a very comprehensive protocol that was going to match what, we, what we've always done. And I know that's the intent, yep. mm -hmm. you know? So I just wish it could have been handled differently because I, I think that um, it just caused a lot of unnecessary concern and angst in the community. Um, and um, the misunderstanding about how it went down wasn't, um, was hard to communicate. Can I speak on that a little bit? Absolutely. It, so I'd like to address, um, a few layers of, of issues as I see see it with what's occurred. Um, I guess, uh, first of all, recognizing the severity in particular of people who um, have students with, with um, food allergies and, and <coughs> how concerning that is and important it is to them and, um, and what it means to have a policy versus a procedure and why the nursing staff wants the, the procedures in, in lieu of the policies. I'm, I'm hoping they can answer that for me because I agree you know, that we do have multiple policies that are you know, mirror, mirror the law and I think that that can be beneficial. And so to me it leads to a, a greater discussion of when do we um, have policies, when do we rely on procedures and why do we have both and, and what are the protections what are the benefits and risks of both? And so um, I'd like to hear more from the, the community. I'd like to hear from the nursing. I'd also like to hear from you know, the, the lawyers um, about what their, their thoughts on, are on that. Um, because I, you know, a, my concern about a protocol is that could change with the administration. That doesn't need, necessarily need board approval, um, that that's not readily available perhaps to the public, and I have a lot of concerns about what that means for the implementation, and that is not by any means casting any um, judgment on the nursing staff who, I don't have a child with a food allergy, um, but they've provided nothing but great care to my, my children. I couldn't say better things about them, but I can't imagine the stress associated with having to deal with that on a, on a daily basis and rely on somebody else to provide that care. Mm -hmm. One thing I would like to, like to add again is that um, students who have allergies are really looked at as on an individual basis now. Where before, if a child had a peanut allergy, all kids with peanut allergies follow the same procedure. They don't necessarily do that anymore. Right. You're, you know, they take each child and what your child needs, what kind of allergy they have, because there's different types of peanut allergies. We have kids now who have milk allergies, wheat allergies, strawberry allergies, different types of things. So they take every child on an individual basis, create a health plan, 
And if it gets to the point where it's interfering with their learning, then it becomes a 504. And that's a very prescriptive plan for each individual child, which is different than when you just have a policy. But the policy can also have that sort of the educational component and, and mm -hmm. encouragement that that would be, you know, encouraged that will provide um, ed education to fellow student students and um, parents that they will provide peanut-free, you know, snacks and that sort of thing. And so I, I guess I hear you on that, but I don't understand what, I don't understand. Okay. what the risk is or the, the downfall is to having a policy as well, I guess. And that's something I'd like to learn more. And so I'm sorry for the people that have experienced the stress of, of going through this process, but um, I found out, I think yesterday, that the nurses weren't available, even though we um, made the request at our policy meeting either December. December 18th, I sent them a message from the policy meeting at 540 saying that I am at a school board policy meeting and they're requesting that you attend. And it was the holidays and most people, I would say, do not really communicate during the holidays, especially the Christmas holiday. And um, so I didn't hear back from them uh, until yesterday. Well, I'm not casting judgment. I just, just, I just, I just would like, like to clarify. I would just like to, to clarify for, for people that were placed in that position and apologize for that because I know that that was stressful. I see the validity in that stress and, and having a child in that situation. Um, it was added to the agenda and, and, and probably shouldn't have been. It was removed from the agenda, as I understand it, for that reason. And I asked for it to be put back on the agenda so that that information could be provided to the public and we can express that because these discussions should be happening here. So um, hopefully we can have more information and, and um, address it. The, the other thing I would add um, as the policy committee continues to work is that for a number of years, well before I arrived in Scarborough, the policy committee has been working to clean up the policy manual. We have a number of policies that are not required nor are they recommended. And the intent behind that um, has been, from my understanding, to make the policy manual more manageable and make it easier for families to navigate. With that being said, you all have the purview to add additional policies beyond what's required and what's recommended. And so if it feels important to continue to have the policy, I think you, you get with the experts, the nurses, and ask them to clarify what that looks like. Um, so it doesn't have to go away. I think these were selected because they're not required or recommended. Thank you. Well, and the nurses asked for them to be removed. And, and I, I, I mean, whether it's a policy, whether it's a procedure, whether it's a regulation, a protocol, I, I think that um, Joanne's point is very valid about how most kids have health plans and 504 plans if it, if it meets that level of need. However, more information is better than less information. So there's nothing wrong with somehow placing that procedure and protocol that the nurses follow to deal with allergies in a public place. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I would actually endorse having a health manual that has all of our health, follow, health procedures and regulations that the nurses follow in one iBook that can be put on the website so we all have access to that. They've been trying to, that's one of their goals right now, Perfect. working with Sean. That's great. They have one nurse working with Sean to get all their forms and everything <coughs> on um, the website. And also last year, this is our third, second year, um, we have uh, an online system health source where everything is entered electronically and then emails go out to parents. So for instance, your child's medication is down, you have, they have about 10 days, they, an email blast goes out to that parent saying your medication is down. And um, so that's been very helpful and useful to parents. And like, you know, your EpiPen is out of date, you get an email. Um, and they don't hear from you, then they give you a phone call. <laughs> okay. That's great. Thanks, everybody. Uh, next meeting is Tuesday, January 15th, 4.30. We'll continue working policies ADC and JIC, as well as introducing BEDB and BEDBA agenda and agenda format. Are the other nurses going to attend that meeting? Yes, uh, I'll have. Okay. okay. Thank you. So then that will be modified to include the nurses. Thank you. <laughs> I'd also, um, just in terms of policy, like to um, just suggest that we consider meeting um, twice a month 
um, for a while so we can start to clean this up. As Julie mentioned earlier, there's a lot of work to be done in policy, and I don't think one meeting a month is going to cut it. So I would be really willing to, to up our number of meetings that we have moving forward. And I also will um, bring to the table on the 15th um, the idea of having a draft <coughs> policy folder accessible to the public so that they can um, see in real time um, what we're working on in policy. I think that would be really good for the community to see that work it happening. And so I will be bringing that to our group to discuss the pros and cons of doing that. Awesome. So I think we're running pretty tight on time, so I'll try okay. and fly through this. Um, but finance, so we spent the last month or so, I think I'll speak for myself, but I think April as well, just kind of getting up to speed with um, the process, uh, the system, meeting, I've met with Kate a couple times, just understanding, you know, what the process that they go through today, the language, um, things like that. So we had our first meeting uh, back in December, and we went through a lot of the protocols and procedures, and then we also went through the Q1 financials, um, which are posted online. Anyone can have a look at those um, currently. And then some of the other activities that we've done to date um, is uh, Kate and Julie held budget staff budget sessions at all the schools to reach out. Uh, it was an opportunity for the teachers to come, and April and I sat in on one of them, um, and they came and just expressed sort of where their needs are for the upcoming year. Um, what's worked for them, what hasn't worked for them, what they would expect, um, or, or some of their hopes and desires out of the budget next year. Um, and so our next meeting is um, going to be next Monday, January 7th at 5.30. Um, and at that meeting, one of the things we're going to be discussing, working with um, town council. Um, so I've been in conversation with Sean, um, who's the chair of the town council. Finance Committee, we haven't had the opportunity to connect, but I think, uh, generally speaking, everyone's on board with having a joint uh, town council and school board committee. Um, so we'll get some of those meetings on the calendar. Um, we'll look at the Q2 financials, um, and then we'll obviously also going to talk through how we can best engage with the community, community throughout the budget process. Um, one of the ways that we're doing that um, and has actually already kicked off, so just a plug for this, is the, the Listen to Learn sessions that Julie and Tom are hosting. I think the first one was today. Yes. Um, and if you want to give us a little 30 second overview on how that went. Sure. Um, so it, the first session was today at 10 here right in Town Hall. Erin um, was there this morning as well, so she's really working hard today. <laughs> um, we also had about five other community members who were able to attend, or maybe four, and then a couple of staff who were able to attend. Um, it was a really engaging conversation. I think it went on two hours, we were close to two hours. Um, and I, I like the small group setting. Um, obviously we wanna have big turnouts at these, but it really allows for high levels of engagement. And we talked about um, a variety of school and town issues. And like last year, we're compiling those um, so that folks can sort of see the emerging themes that are coming across each of these sessions. And I believe our next session, um, I know it's on the website, but I was wanting to, I don't know if I can. Next Thursday, isn't it? Is it this Thursday? Next Thursday? Yeah. Um, there's four throughout the month of January, so there's plenty of opportunity for people to attend. Um, and they're on. It's listed on our school website and also the town website. And there's so there's two more that are at six o'clock, and then another one that will be um, earlier in the day again. So we're trying to do it in a variety of locations and at a variety of times so that we can increase accessibility. Um, the one thing I would just add to what Sarah was saying earlier about the staff listening sessions, Kate and I did send a letter out to the whole staff sharing, and the board, I believe you saw it, um, sharing what some of the emerging themes were. And I can say that that was a very valuable experience, and um, I think it's going to be really inform, inform our budget process really well, and we got really positive feedback from staff about that as well. Okay. Yeah, I if I could just speak to that for a second too. Um, this was the first time that you had done that, correct? Mm -hmm. That yep. Kate and Julie had gone into the schools to ask for, specifically to ask for staff feedback. Um, and Sarah had asked if school board could attend um, those sessions and then because of the late Ness and the calendar, um, Sarah was able to attend one at the primary schools and I went to one at the high school. Um, and it was 
it was awesome to be able to connect with the teachers and to really hear what their budget priorities are firsthand. Um, and so moving forward, I would definitely encourage um, the board to participate in all of those sessions. Um, yeah. I thought that was a really great opportunity. Yeah, yeah that's great. I think that's I'm it. Thinking it's probably the, the shortest finance update. <laughs> <laughs> all right, um, 10.0, new business. Um, 10.1, a motion to accept the meeting minutes of December 6, 2018. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Seeing none, ready to vote. All those in favor? All right, passes unanimously, seven and two. Um, I'm gonna bundle 10.2 and 10.3, the first reading of policy GIC and the first reading of policy ADC. I'd like to move these, make a motion to move these back to committee for further work. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Or any additional discussion, I suppose. <laughs> um, all those in favor? Okay, unanimous, seven and two. Um, similarly, easy word for me to say, 10.4, um, the removal of policies, JLCE, JLCER, JLCEA, JLCEAR, and JLCDA. I'd like for these to be tabled until a later date. So moved. Second. Okay. All right, ready to vote on this one? All those in favor? All right, seven and two. Um, we do need to add one additional item on new business um, as a 10.5, and that is to expend, extend the time for new business. Under policy, we cannot go beyond 9.30 with new business. However, 13.1 um, is the motion to approve um, the bus driver contract, but we have an executive session prior to. So can I have a motion to extend the time for new business beyond 9.30? Second. Second. Second time. Do I have the same time? 10.30. So moved. Second. Okay. Discussion? Okay. All those in favor? Seven and two. Um, Dylan, Kristen, you guys don't have to stay until 10.30. <laughs> um, 11.0, motion to go into executive session pursuant to 1 MRSA 4056C for the purpose of considering a contractual proposal for the superintendent search. So moved. Second. Okay. Ready to vote? Okay. Unanimous, seven and two. Motion to go into executive session pursuant to one MRSA 4056D for the purpose of discussing the bus driver contract to return to public session. So moved. Second. Okay, all those in favor? Motion passes, seven and oh. Okay, we will be back. Hmm? I think you should. <laughs>
2018-2021 bus driver contract. So moved. Second. Discussion? Oh, Amy, did you have a... What's that? Did I... Did you have a statement about that? Well, I read it, the, I read it last time, and okay, I said in committee report that we were going to be voting. I just, again, I mean, I'm so happy that this is settled and that we have a bus driver's contract moving forward. Agreed. Pending vote. No, pending vote. <laughs> all right. If we're all good, ready to vote. All those in favor? Unanimous, 7.0. And thank you for everybody on the committee with that. 14.0, it is 950. Is there a motion to adjourn? So, so moved. moved. Second. Second. Beautiful. I'm gonna assume there's no opposition, so all those in favor? <laughs> <laughs> Seven and oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.